Welcome, uh, welcome everybody uh, uh, to uh, Palazzo Strozzi and to the Faculty of uh, Political and Social Sciences of Scuola Normale Superiore for an event uh, of the uh, Institute of Advanced Studies, Carlo Azeglio Ciampi. And the topic wouldn't be, couldn't be uh, better fitting with the title of our institute. We are going to talk about central banks and monetary policy inflation money. Uh, I'm uh, Guglielmo Meardi, I'm the Dean of, uh, of this faculty, so my role is uh, to chair, to moderate, and to uh, organize the question and discussion at the end, but also to start with, to uh, introduce the speakers that we have today. The first one is Manuela Moschello, uh, she is an associate uh, professor in uh, uh, international political economy in this faculty. Her work has been mostly on uh, uh, financial institutions, especially in the European uh, uh, financial uh, system. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Matthias uh, uh, Thiemann of uh, Sciences Po, he's associate professor of European public policy of Sciences Po, and he's a sociologist because uh, also sociologists deal with this topic, and uh, um, he's an expert in particular of ideas and financial regulations. Then we have Mario Pianta, who is the chair of the Institute, uh, the Carlo Azeglio Ciampi Institute, and is professor of uh, economic policy in this in this faculty. His work stretches uh, around, uh, across many, many topics from industrial policy to inequalities uh, uh, to uh, economic policy more, uh, more in general. And he's also currently the president of the Italian Economist Association. Then we have Francesco uh, Saraceno, also from Sciences Po, where he's uh, a deputy director of the Observatoire uh, Francais de Conjoncture Economique and uh, is one of the main protagonists of debates about macroeconomic policy in, uh, in uh, Europe, um, both academically and in uh, different roles as advisor and as public uh, intellectual, uh, advisor of ILO, Confindustria in the past, and, uh, and, and many other, many other uh, institutions. And finally, uh, we also have uh, uh, Martina Ciccioni, with, who is at the Banca d'Italia. She's, she's a senior senior economist in the Monetary Analysis Division of the Research Department of the Bank of Italy. Bank of Italy, we discussed it this morning, in its uh, historical role in Italian capitalism, in the Italian state, and so on. But besides that, has been a hugely important intellectual and scientific institutions in providing uh, uh, you know, the, the, the space and the, the resources for studying economic uh, and economic policy. So these are our guests. Now, what are we going to talk about? Uh, we're going to talk about the title is the changing role of central banks and the return of inflation. Now, personally, I'm not an expert of central banks. I'm not an expert of inflation. Uh, my field is industrial relations. And I uh, really welcome a uh, topic like this one because in the last uh, 20, 30 years, Way, the wage issue, pay, money, which used to be basically the synonym of uh, the industrial relations and of, uh, of uh, the, labor, the labor question, became first a marginal issue, well, one of the, from being the issue in industrial relations and in employment, it became one of the issues, then became one of the least important issues, then it nearly disappeared. Uh, so if you look at conferences on industrial relations, employment relations, pay became less, less important. And the whole discussion about collective bargaining was, well, about uh, how collective bargaining is good to discuss non-pay issues. And this was obviously associated with the fact that with inflation falling in the last um, 30 years, basically, 30, 35 years, of course, wage negotiating wage rises every year had become a less uh, uh, pressing issue for most, uh, most workers, with a number of implications, that is, fewer strikes, but also a problem for trade unions to legitimize their, 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 their role. Uh, so if there was some discussion about pay in the field, my field in the last 20, 25 years, it was not so much about how much pay should people get, but what kind of pay. 
you know, should be more individualized, less individualized, a bit more variable, less variable, should there be equality between men and women, between people of different categories. But the issue of how much wages should be, that, 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 that had become nearly, nearly irrelevant. To the point I remember I used to work in the UK, when discussion were made when there was some hope of improving government had put in, in its program, the, the, the information and consultation rights for, uh, for workers, you know, one of proposals was to, well, improve the rights of collective bargaining, and most people, even on the labor side, were saying, no, 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 not collective bargaining, because then people waste time talking about pay. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's better to have other things, so we don't talk about pay, we talk about the important issues, such as organization and so on. Now, in the last couple of years, we have inflation coming back, and suddenly, well, all the rust institutions that we have to deal with that are uh, not there, or they don't know how to work, they don't know how to do it. We have to read back, you know, things to which I, I read because I'm old enough to, 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 you know, to have studied when inflation was still a problem. But you know, in, the la in the last 20 years, those who study industrial relations, for instance, but also, uh, you know, in more in general socioeconomic issues, well, inflation had been quite, quite much. So it's welcome to, to be back on this, on the red meat as, uh, as, uh, of, of pay and, uh, and, uh, and money and uh, uh, the, the purchase power of, uh, of money and so on. So we have the four great speakers here because they all have written books on somehow this topic, on central banks, which are you know, those who decide how much money to print, which is uh, one of the most important variables in, uh, on inflation, on, uh, on specifically, specifically on inflation. And uh, we have uh, a bit of varieties of books, two in English, two in Italian, uh, one is collective and uh, collective effort. But, uh, let, let's look just at the title. Manuela has written a, a book for Cornell University Press, which is coming out within days, if I remember. That. Well, uh, Unexpected Revolutionaries How Central Banks Made and Unmade Economic Orthodoxy. Then Matthias has written a book on, for Cambridge University Press, Taming the Cycles of Finance, Central Banks and the Macro Prudential Shift in Financial Regulation. So, really, two books. One is about central banks as revolutionary, and the other one is about central banks as macro prudential people. You know, so already a bit of, of debate. You know, I'm looking forward to how this, this can be can discussed. And then we get into you know our hands dirty with inflation and, and, and prices going up. The, the, the book by, by edited by Marius is a collective effort, uh, which includes other two researchers from, uh, from this place, like uh, Marco Stamagna and Vincenzo Maccarone. And it uh, is about the causes, consequences, and policies about, uh, about inflation. It's very much being tried to bring back a public debate about inflation. It's a book which is accessible also for those who have not studied too much uh, uh, macroeconomics and, and, and monetary monetary. Economics and uh, well, inflation. We forgot how to talk about it, so it's very important to have it to have a book like this one. And Francesco Saracino has written a, a written book, uh, Oltre le Banche Centrali: Inflazione, Diseguaglianza, and Political Economy. Inflation, Inequality, and Economic Policies. And uh, I think with inequality, uh, uh, which is one of the main topic of research and debate in this faculty, we will certainly have a very interesting critical discussion in which the, the contribution of everybody is welcome. So now uh, I would ask Manuela to start with uh, her presentation. Oh no, we, we changed it. Oh, I don't know why we changed without it. asking me, there's been a, a change in program without my authorization, <laughs> but fine, ex post, that's a fair accompli. Uh, Matthias will start and not Manuela. So we start okay. with the cautions. We start with the caution and then the revolution. Exactly. Right, all right. Uh, so that, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Um, oh, yeah, thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. It's a, it's a great honor and great pleasure for me to be here and to be in front of people who hopefully, who seem to be caring about central banks and their changing role. And um, so I appreciate, I appreciate that. I want to give you a 15 minutes summary of a 45 minutes talk that I gave two hours ago <laughs> about, this, about this book. Um, which is uh, about the macroprudential shift in post-crisis financial regulation. So it's about the fact that the book started 10 years ago with the simple question, what if anything has changed after the financial crisis in terms of financial regulation? And I was taking a wager back then because I said something changed. If nothing had changed, no book would have been written. And you have to know that because I will make the case that something has changed. 
something important has changed. Central banks today carry the role of financial stability. They are firefighters, firefighters for financial stability. But my argument will be they have not become policemen. They are firefighters, but they're not policemen. And uh, the book, is, in essence, traces the struggle of the macroprudential thought collective over the last, initially I thought the last 20 years, as it turns out, over the last 50 years. So these people, which I argue in the book, have first been institutionalized at the Basel uh, Bank for International Settlements in the Euro Currency Standing Group in the 1970s, have essentially worried about the following thing. How do we guarantee financial stability when banks and financial markets increasingly interact? And with the breakdown of Bretton Woods, they look at the Euro dollar market and they go like, how do we deal with this? And what I show in the book is that from 1970s to the 1990s, they're essentially dominated by uh, a much more famous group at the Bank for International Settlements, namely the Basel Committee for Banking Supervision that you may have heard about. And these guys uh, who are uh, basically um, microprudential, so they are arguing that if you take care of a bank in and of itself, everything is taken care of, they tell these people to shut up, okay? They basically, we understand that you're really worried about this, but uh, we, the Basel Committee for Banking Supervisions, have the jurisdiction to speak about this, and if anything, we shall do microprudential regulation. Now, what I, what I show then in the book, which by the way is studying the Federal Reserve Bank of America, the Bank of England, and the ECB, what I'm showing in the book is how this thought collective was then empowered in the 1990s through the increasing financial instability. And this increasing financial instability is basically, <laughs> now I skip all this, uh, um, this uh, um, basic financial instability that starts in the 1990s is going to empower this thought collective. So in the third chapter of the book, I, I basically show how um, academic economists and applied economists and central banks keep discussing if and what should be done about financial stability. And the real world phenomenon, which is uh, financial instability in East Asia in 1997 and the dot-com bubble in 2000, do invite themselves in this, uh, in this discussion. And while academic economists have basically, since the 1970s, decided to ignore financial instability as an unimportant problem of macroeconomics, central bankers do not have that luxury. And for me, it was really fascinating to trace these conferences, because in these conferences, you could, you could see two approaches. On the one hand, in, I would like to use the example of the Bank of Japan conference in 1998, uh, on the one hand, you have the Japanese central bank and economists from Asia who basically say, guys, not a debate. There is financial instability and we have to deal with it. This just happened to us. And then you have academic economists, uh, in particular also employed at the Federal Reserve Bank of America, uh, that say, if you do not have a theory of financial instability, of systemic risk, you're not allowed to speak about it. Only if you have a model can you speak about financial instability. And so what I show is that these central bankers that have been dominated for so long, they start to reach out to academic economists. They invite them, they nurture them, they develop concepts. These conferences happen at the margin of, uh, of the economics discipline but they allow a certain conceptual work that will establish will be the beginning of establishing financial instability as a risk object. That is as something that needs to be taken care of by central banks. And in the book, I show how certain concepts such as contagion and herding become really prominent, whereas others, the focus of my book, Financial Cycle, really are at the margin of the 
uh, of the profession, financial cycle, by the way, here I show you a first representation of it, is the idea that, in this case, the United States of America undergoes booms and busts. You can see the blue line here represents the booms and busts of the financial system in the United States of America from 1972 to 2011. And the idea is essentially, if we can identify this cycle, we can intervene in it before it gets out of control. We can take away the punch bowl before the party gets going and thereby prevent these deep busts, which are when the, when the, when the blue line goes down. Okay? So this is the dream, this is the hope of these people that I'm tracing in this book, that we could intervene and stabilize the financial system, tame the cycles of finance, so to speak. And what I show in this book is that these guys essentially manage to establish financial instability as a risk object. And in 2008, I apologize for moving around, but in 2008, they get the mandate to implement it. And when I studied the 2007-2008 debate, what we can see is this thought collective is really central in framing the financial crisis as systemic. So you can really show that the Financial Stability Forum, led by Mario Draghi, is central in arguing that what's going on is systemic and has to do with the fact that financial markets and banks have come to interact very, very, very closely. At the same time, I show that this thought collective really only manages to insert itself marginally in the actual banking regulation after the financial crisis. And that's the uh, counter-cyclical capital buffer that is installed in 2008, 2009, in the Basel regulation. However, and I think that's very important for the topic of inflation to which I want to return, it fails miserably in the discussion of the regulation of what comes to be called shadow banking. So these guys have the analysis, they have the claims, but they do not get jurisdictions. They say um, we need to stop the procyclical tendencies of financial markets. We need to possibly disentangle banks and financial markets. But as they make these arguments, they face market regulators and they face accounting regulators that absolutely do not agree, and so they are, in a sense, defeated. So what I then do in the book is I trace the next 10 years, and I ask what happens in the next 10 years. And what I show is that central bank economists, together with allies in academia, develop the notion of financial cycles and develop measures of systemic risk that allow to anticipate uh, the build-up of systemic risk and the, the dangers to financial instability. So they do manage to do that, and that's rather very impressive, to me at least. Uh, and that is the change that I want to posit has been the most important change. Today, financial instability and how it operates is a fundamental element of economics, which it hasn't been before the financial crisis. Now, the second point that I want to make about this, however, is that it had a very perverse impact on the way that we do financial instability mitigation today. Why? Because as I show in the book, in the upswing, little, little happens. So it's really a little bit frustrating. I feel with these people, so to say, as I read their financial stability reports of the second half of 2010s. They have now developed all these metrics. They show to everyone, look, we're in the upswing. Risks are building up. We should do something about it. But, and I, I oversimplify here because I have 15 minutes, but nothing much is happening. However, because they are so aware of the risks and these contagion effects and the, the instability of the financial system as a whole, when the financial system hits the downturn, that is to say, if you, if you follow me again one more time here, so my argument is, Essentially, these guys, why they are today able to downstream, yes, as they, as they enter the downswing, I think I've made my point, as they enter the downswing, their knowledge becomes immediately active. And central banks today have become 
um, I don't want to say trigger happy, but they are immediately there when, when financial instability threatens to unravel growth. Okay? And um, I want to use two data points for this, and then I want to conclude because I think I'm, I'm running a bit out of time, and you see that I had a few more slides. Uh, but uh, the point is, this is the first uh, evidence that I would like to show you. This is March 2020, okay? And you can see how the central bank's balance sheet at about February 2020 uh, is rather very low. Uh, well, it's interesting. Uh, it's still $1 trillion, okay? And how in the, in, the, in, the, in the face of two months, three months, all of these three central banks will majorly expand their balance sheets. And the thing that has gone unnoticed on the public radar is not that they do this to finance government deficits or whatever. They do it because there is an, a pending financial crisis in the shadow banking system in the United States of America in particular. And so the Fed will, will use their liquidity interventions to stabilize the shadow banking system, which they have no capacity to regulate, which they know fully well is super dangerous. And in that moment, they will basically, to put it polemically, bail out hedge funds whose bets have gone terribly wrong. Uh, because Not because they like hedge funds, but because they understand that if the hedge funds go down, the banks go down. And if the banks go down, the entire financial system goes down. Okay? And this is what I argue in the book is the current situation. We're essentially in an asymmetric regime where in the boom phase nothing much happens, but as the bust threatens, central banks immediately intervene with large-scale liquidity interventions. And if you do not uh, find that one data point is enough, I agree with you. Let's take 2023, uh, the Silicon Valley bank crisis. What happens there? The Central Bank of America immediately provides unlimited, they, not unlimited, they provide liquidity on par for any collateral that this bank can provide. In other words, as financial instability threatens, the Central Bank is immediately there as a firefighter and backs the financial system, keeps it stable. And the argument uh, that I'm making in the book, so it's basically you have a, an unexpected outcome of this thought collective, because I don't think this thought collective set about to stabilize the financial system forever. What they, you could argue that they wanted to do that, but they wanted to do it in an anticipatory way. They wanted to intervene before the crisis happens. And today, rather than being policemen, they have merely become firefighters. And what does this mean for inflation? And this is an argument that I <coughs> dare to make for the discussion. It's not proven, so it's not but there are voices that say that bailing out the financial system whenever financial instability threatens not only stabilizes the financial system but also pushes inflation because a very important factor that is the financial system which would lead to deflation. So basically, by, by they're, they're afraid of deflation, a topic to which Manuela will return to. They're very much afraid of deflation. And so they seek to stabilize the financial system because they are afraid of deflation. And by doing so, they prop up the financial system and engender ever more credit production, which, which contributes to inflation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this um, presentation. Very clear. We have to have some. We have some teaching. Because we are so many at this table, usually that place is free, but it's not. <laughs> yes, we save the discussion to the end, let's say. Obviously, there are, you know, huge question. I can make an emergency meeting and then try to, to address them, but otherwise, we wait until the end. Uh, Manuela, please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Now, I know you're all craving to add my book to the Christmas gift list, but please wait a little bit more. Probably you can add to the New Year's Eve list <laughs> if you celebrate, uh, but it's coming out in early 2024. Um, so before getting to the title and to probably also some of the differences uh, with Matthias' work, uh, let me start with the commonalities. Uh, I think that uh, what 
both Matthias and I are interested in is the story of change, you know, in central banks. And, uh, uh, you know, I arrived uh, just short before the start of the return of inflation, uh, but I think this is still a very relevant story. Uh, you know, some of my students here were obliged to take my course on institutional analysis, and we spend a lot of time, or Phil Fioretos is here, talking about historical institutionalism, and so they know that they have this fixation that we have to put things in context, and what happens at points, at point A influences what happens uh, in points B. And this is exactly the story I was interested in uh, since the very beginning. This is the transformation that central banks have been through since at least 2008, and then up to the 2020 uh, crisis. And I also want to understand that this period, I think, is important for another reason. That is a story of deflation rather than inflation, right? And I think this is also important, this switch among regimes. This morning we were talking about it with uh, the Bank of Italy and the presentation of their own book about the history of the Bank of Italy. As a scholar, what I found really interesting is that while we have a lot of analysis about inflation and how central banks deal with inflation, deflationary periods have been much less studied. But they are as much as distributive, <laughs> as much as important as inflationary moments are. So let me give you some more details about the book. So the motivation I told you, I mean, for me it was really amazing to see that the transformation that had been taking place uh, in central banking in really a decade, right? Uh, now, if you're not familiar with central banks, uh, I think that we all think of central banks as kind of, you know, kind of obscure, conservative people. If you were here this morning, they were all wearing black ties, so, you know, exactly the bureaucrats you can imagine, right? They're not the exciting and the revolutionaries of my title here. So they were kind of boring people, right? So, but then, I mean, with the 2008 crisis, uh, and here I'm quoting from Claudio Borio that also Matthias cites extensively in his book, uh, and he's a central banker, something unthinkable happened. You know, say they really changed their, the, the way of, of doing work, right? And it was really a, a transnational, if you want, phenomenon. Because from the 1970s and 1980s, since Volcker in the United States, I will get back to it in a second, so central banks had become very similar and well circumscribed institutions. They were assigned a very narrow mandate, price stability, so they have to control the value of money, and they have to do with a very clear technology, interest rates. Okay, so you move interest rates up and down to stabilize the economic system. And in less than a decade, they did everything else. And they did all the things that they were supposed not to do. You know, they helped governments, they, do, they did quantitative easing, they did a lot of financial interventions, you know, the types that Matthias was talking about. Here I wrote, they moved to monetary interventionism. I could have also written financial interventionism, you know, they saved the banks, they put a lot of liquidity in the system, they really did everything that was not in the playbook. They even invented more. Uh, so for me, I was really fascinated how, you know, these conservative institutions could turn into revolutionary agents. And also because this is not just a story of central banks. Central banks are really key institutions of capitalist system. You know, they really became the linchpin of the, if you want, uh, I think I use the words a couple of times in my book, but they really became the linchpin of the neoliberal capitalist system that uh, took hold from the 1980s and 1990s. So it is plausible to think that if the institutions at the center of the system change, probably the system changes as well. So this is one of the open questions uh, of the book. So where did I start? You know, as any good scholar, I started from the literature, right? And, uh, you know, I was really, really dissatisfied with what I found, right? Because uh, when I started working, there were already excellent analyses about the transformations of central banks and what was going on. Uh, and in the book, I say that the dominant account out there can be described as a technocratic view. And let me say that Matthias is also one of the person I criticize in, in this respect in the book, and many other friends of mine I have to say, you know, people that have used this idea that, uh, you know, what matters is the political battles that take place among bureaucrats within central banks, okay? So basically what I found is that the literature used to explain this transformation in central banks with the variants of this technocratic argument. On the one hand, there were those that were supporting the only game in town arguments. So basically central banks could transform and adapt, if you want, because they had the independence 
for doing that. So they were not linked to, to political power. They had not to be responsive. So they could do it. They could change. And the other thing that is probably more prominent is also what you hear from, uh, what you heard from Matthias, is that you know central bankers learned. You know they were able to embrace new ideas, and so on the basis of new ideas, they were able to act differently. And you know the usual story was the comparison with the Great Depression. You know, and you know the argument about the Fed back in the 30s, the, the Fed made a lot of mistakes. It was inaction; they didn't support the banks enough, and so they created a mess. This time around, they said no more. So they had learned the right lesson this time. And I said, look, I mean, I have great sympathy, and I don't think that they are wrong, right? It's, the, it's important what the technocrats uh, learn within institutions, and you know, I've also studied ideas in, in, my, in the past, and I value them. Uh, and I think that uh, you know, it's really also political battles, also to go back to, to Matthias work, what's going on within central banks. But it's not the whole story. Right? The story that I want to tell is that you know, central banks, OK, they are independent. They are epistemic community. But they are not just technocratic institutions. You know, these are still public institutions. And so in the book, I say we have to recover a conception of central banks as political institutions, their independence notwithstanding, where political goes beyond the political battles among the bureaucrats, but politically in its true sense, right, with the relationship with their political principles, the governments, the legislators, the public opinion. So because, you know, they are independent, but they do not exist in a vacuum, right? They need some kind of political support, you know? In the book, I start with one of my favorite books, Peter Gurevich, right? And I say, paraphrasing Peter Gurevich, he was talking about economic policy, of course, but they say monetary policy, conventional or unconventional, always needs political support. And so this is the story that I'm going to tell, that uh, you know, central banks could adapt only when they had political support. But this comes with a caveat, right? I told you, central banks are independent, they are experts and technocratic, so the way in which they gather political support is different than through elections, right? They do not go and ask your, our votes, right? So, so in the book I say they maintain political support through their reputation. You know, by building a certain institutional image about themselves and binding themselves to this image, right? So this is, uh, you know, the starting point. So building on this assumption, basically the argument is I do in my book uh, is that, you know, if you want to understand this institutional transformation and how central banks adapted, we have to see how central banks managed the reputational threats that they were coming out from the transformation in their environment. So there were the crises, and so the world around them changed, and so they had to adapt their past reputation. So they preempted and managed some reputational threat. And in a nutshell, I said that you know it was a reputation protection type of movement that led them away from economic orthodoxy to a kind of experimentalism, if you want, to, uh, uh, to, to cite Jonathan Zeitling here. So basically, central banks could depart from orthodoxy only when political support was in place, and I'm going to tell you more about this political support, or when support was waning, so when public opinion was against them, and so they had to prove that they were good institutions, and so they, they kind of reacted to win back political support. So how I do it empirically? Uh, the book starts from the 1970s, because the book starts by telling the story of how central banks built this institutional image. It, so it starts with the stagflation, which I think it's very relevant, going back to the argument today, I go back to the time, right, when the main problem was, you know, rampant inflation, stagnant economies, uh, and then we had this heroic figure in central banking that is Volcker, you know, Volcker that became the head of, of the Fed and then suddenly tames inflation, and so it really changes the history of central banking. It really opens up, you know, this moment in which central banks emerge as these institutions with this uh, monetary goal, maintaining price stability, no matter what, they should be independent from governments, and this was successful. It was incredibly successful. I tell the story of the great moderation, Greenspan, the, the, the 2000, and just before 2008, everything was fine. You know, it seems as if they had found the magic formula, right? Uh, I have to say that in this historical chapter, I also delve into the only anomaly of the time, that was Japan. You know, because Japan was really the only country in which, as I say in the book, not everything was bright under the sunshine. 
It was the only country in the Western world that was experiencing deflation, and it never got rid of deflation. So, and I tell the story, and it's a story that went unheard, right? Because everything was fine, everything else. So they didn't hear to any lesson of what was going on in Japan. And then I move, okay, the world, ch and then the world changed for everybody, not just for Japan, it changed for, especially for the jurisdictions that are the main economic powers, you know, for the United States and Europe. And so the book is based on two case studies that are the Fed and the ECB through the 2008 and 2020 crisis. And I study basically three, there is some level of subjectivity here, right? I mean, it, it always involves some level <laughs> of subjective judgment. I mean, this is a very, it's 10 years, but still a lot of things have happened in there. So I decided to focus on three subsectors for both the Fed and the ECB. So their policies in financial assistance, the liquidity, um, the QE, so how they uh, bought uh, you know, bonds and what type of bonds, both public and private, and their reviews of monetary strategies. Because interestingly, both the Fed and the European Central Bank changed their monetary strategy just right before the return of inflation. So between 2020 and 2021, with some irony. And what I find, try to argue with, by analyzing the policy making around these decisions uh, is to show that, you know, there were moments in which central banks were not able to act or they were acting at the minimum level. So they were trying to do the minimum to damage control in the middle of the crisis. The moments in which they departed from orthodoxy, from the old playbook, was only under specific circumstances. When they had government support, which of course was different on the two sides of the Atlantic, because what the, the Congress and, and the US administration did was very different from what Europeans <laughs> cobbled together over time. And also, you know, in the case of the reviews of monetary strategies, for instance, I, I, I hope I clearly show that these strategies are clearly linked to a public backlash. You know, the, the, the central bankers on the two sides of the Atlantic were so much concerned about declining public trust and how this declining public trust was, you know, also a threat for their own reputation, for their own independence, so that they went about and said, you know what, we have to incorporate, you know, social goals, you know, the, what the Fed did. Now we have to prioritize employment back again. We have to take in consideration race, you know, that, and they were talking about race, Matthias know better than I, than I do, you know, they were talking about race and equality, and, you know, we have to find employment, it was just 2020, right? And, and for the ECB was likewise, you know, with this phase of this public backlash, they started talking more about climate change. They even adjusted the inflation target, you know, they said it's no longer below but close to 2%. They did it symmetric, you know, because now deflation was also a problem, not just inflation. So they thought, okay, rebalance, right? So that, that, that's the story that, that, that I tried to tell in the book, so that it was a combination of factors that most of the time central banks tried, at least at the beginning, to stick to the past playbook, and they could really depart from it only under certain circumstances, with government support, or when you know, their reputation was threatened by negative public backlash. So let me summarize the basically the two findings uh, that I think uh, probably I would <laughs> like to say that are the, the, the takeaways from, from the book. Um, so the first one I already anticipated, and I think it's relevant also for the inflation debate today, is that central, central banks cannot do it alone. You know, we used to think of central banks as really powerful institutions, you know, they can do whatever they want. It's not exactly true, right? So as I was saying, a key condition for them to act was government support. Whether, you know, they had the full support of the government in terms of money, or it was a division of responsibility in Europe, you know, everybody does something and so we protect uh, the central bank, but they needed some degree of support coming from. Think about Draghi, you know, the, the announcement of whatever it takes, you know. There are many reasons behind that, but one of the reasons is that Draghi gathered that he had the support from the German government, right? It would have been impossible without, you know, and also the, the, the change in the institutional architecture of the EU, right? It would have been impossible without that. So, with, I mean, uh, without undermining Draghi's important role, but, uh, you know, it was a, a broader change than that. But so, this calls for, you know, rethinking the coordination between monetary and fiscal policy makers, because as I was saying, before 2008, it was based on a strict separation. 
monetary policy is monetary policy. It should not get influenced by fiscal considerations whatsoever. Fiscal authorities should be kind of reined in. Now we, they realize that you have to talk to each other to stabilize economic activity. And I think that this does apply not just when you fight deflation. I think that now in, in an inflationary scenarios, there is space for coordination, right? Monetary policy is monetary policy. They control interest rates. So that's what they can do. But fiscal policymakers, they, they can control prices. They can put you know, a cap on energy prices. They can support workers. They can do a lot of stuff. And, so, and they could do a recession that comes from raising interest rates much less painful. So there is space for coordination and thinking and, uh, and also for decarbonization is the same thing. If we want to, to do a climate transition, we have to find ways in which central banks and fiscal authorities interact without damaging each other, you know, without damaging central bank independence and uh, without damaging you know, political freedom in the end. The other finding, it's probably more theoretical, it's uh, who central banks listen to. Um, in, in the book, I said I criticize the, the technocratic view. I build also on, on the critical political economy literature that says, you know, central banks' independence does not depoliticize policy, ma policy making, you know, but, uh, you know, central bankers always take political decisions, okay? But this critical political economy literature usually says that the only actors that central banks listen to are financial market actors, right? So they are the only actors. And I said, look, guys, it's not true. Because in my book, what I found is that they, central bankers really care about the relationship with their governments, about the relationship with public opinion, right? So it's really important also to open up and think about, you know, what are the windows of opportunities for, you know, public citizens and governments to have these interactions with central banks. Now, I'm not naive, just to be clear. You know, central banks continue to listen to financial markets, and rightly so, right? Because it's how monetary policy works. You know, it's also through the, the, the inputs through the financial system. But at the same time, I think there is reason to, uh, at least to be positive about how we think of the democratic oversight and accountability of central banks, that there are, you know, ways in which, you know, public opinion and the governments can uh, have a positive conversation with central banks about the priorities to pursue. That slide, back to the future. Of course, as I said, I mean, I stopped, uh, you know, my period covers, you know, the deflationary period. I really stopped in 2021 when they finished the monetary strategy reviews, which I found really <laughs> ironic. We were chatting over lunch about it. And then, of course, inflation is back. Uh, as you can imagine, I mean, in the conclusion, I speculate about it. I just can do that. So it, it's going to be back to normal. It's going to be back to the, I don't know, to the 1970s. Uh, uh, and I don't have a clear answer to that. But I also think that much has changed in the world of central banking over the past 15 years. You know, of this, you know, the, the, the story that Matthias told about how they got enmeshed with financial stability, you know, how they got enmeshed also with climate change, at least in Europe, it cannot be dissolved at the stroke of the pen. And so it's gonna hinge also if they are now fighting inflation. And also, you know, we are fighting inflation now, but who knows <laughs> what's gonna happen in the next 10 years, you know? Who knew that we would have experimented COVID or now the, the, the Russia's war against Ukraine? So let's not hope for more surprises probably and <laughs> I'll stop it here, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Manuela. And we move now to the part more on uh, inflation, uh, uh, specifically with Mario Piano. Thank you very much. I think it is a very stimulating combination of, uh, of uh, perspectives. Um, I also present this book, which is a collective book. We have one of the authors here, Marco Stamegna. Uh, we try to have uh, a, a, an accessible, comprehensive uh, understanding of the causes of inflation, prices of energy in particular for uh, Europe and Italy, the consequences on wages, uh, something uh, Guglielmo Meardi already mentioned, the context of uh, collective uh, broad industrial relation uh, setting and uh, specific dynamics of uh, collective bargaining. Uh, we have uh, also an, an econometric model simulating different uh, the outcomes of different policy options. And then we have uh, 
uh, a rerun of the 70s and 80s uh, uh, just to understand the lessons from the past. And we assembled a team of, of uh, young uh, uh, and scholars plus Claudio Nesuta, who was one of our teachers uh, uh, working a lot on the 70s and 80s. The <clears throat> I think theory matters here, and I think uh, uh, a challenge we, we propose is that we should uh, avoid the mainstream view held by central banks that inflation is a monetary phenomenon, which is uh, a more a window argument rather than a deep understanding. But uh, inflation is a, uh, can be conceptualized as a set of distributional conflicts. Distribution between capital and labor, uh, firms uh, uh, can uh, try to uh, set uh, prices, uh, markets are not uh, perfect, uh, there is market power, and uh, uh, wages have to run up uh, to try to catch up uh, with, uh, with the uh, real value of, uh, of incomes. Uh, we have a strong conflicts within firms uh, between industrial capital, uh, firms with uh, protected markets and market power, as opposed to finance, uh, which has been expanding uh, the value of its activities uh, quite, uh, quite significantly. Um, we have uh, uh, a, 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 an opposition between debtors and creditors, with inflation favoring debtors vis-a-vis -vis creditors. And uh, we cannot talk about inflation as a a phenomenon which hits the economy across the board. There are deep asymmetries. Unless we ex make these uh, asymmetries explicit, we do not understand what are the causes and consequences and the policy actions. There is, uh, on top of these uh, income effects, there are wealth effects on, about the erosion of, uh, of uh, liqu liquid assets and so on. Just to give a sense, the Bank of Italy annual report this year estimated that the increase of prices in energy last, in the last two years caused basically <clears throat> one trillion dollars, one percent of global GDP transfer from the consumers of energy to the producers of energy. And for Italy and Europe, this has been significant. Another thing which is rarely discussed is the fact that inflation is basically a problem for Europe and the US. It's not at all a problem in China, which has a deflation problem. It is a marginal problem in South Korea, East Asia, or Japan with very minor inflation rates. At the same time, however, we have a number of countries, Turkey, Argentina, Iran, with a problematic exponential inflation. But this is really something which has been left uh, on the side. No one has talked about uh, uh, a debt crisis or an inflation crisis of this country to the extent that uh, this was typical in the, in the 90s, for instance. Uh, by the way, it's also interesting that there is little talk about the impact of inflation on competitiveness, on exchange rates, on capital flows, all issues that were prominent in the manuals, in the handbooks when we were uh, students of macroeconomics in Canadian open markets macroeconomics. And now all this seems to be in the, in the, back, uh, in the background. So who are the important ideas? Uh, not Milton Friedman, but Kaleski, who in the 30s understands the nature of inflation. Um, uh, the analysis of the Italian experience of the 70s mm, developed by people like Augusto Graziani and other scholars uh, focusing on, on wage-profit relations, and clearly Minsky. So for Matthias, uh, I think a key point is the, the fact that uh, after mm, 30 years of complete uh, forgetfulness about the financial instability, there, there is the discovery of Minsky moment. But here I would say that uh, the monetary mainstream is always 20 to 30 years late in understanding challenges. So Minsky was rediscovered only after the, uh, the financial crisis of 2008. And as for Manuela, the case 
of the revision uh, of the inflation targets uh, uh, to take into account the deflation arrived 10 years after deflation started to be a problem. So there is a problem of timing and the fact that the mainstream institutions are so slow to understand the nature of, of, uh, of uh, challenges that sometimes are fighting the past war with their own uh, weapons, as in the case of uh, inflation today. I, I skip uh, the debate, the economic uh, theory debate, but uh, you know that uh, the novelty of inflation is basically the fact that there is not anymore in practical experience an inverse relationship between uh, um, low unemployment and high inflation. So, <clears throat> uh, at the same time, however, we have been through a period of uh, neoliberal reorganization of, uh, of economic policies and the institutions which have been changing deeply the nature of uh, uh, economic actors and economic policy frames. For instance, the idea that markets were able to uh, self-regulate and be efficient in the short and in the long term meant that the very idea of price controls or regulation of markets become uh, un unspeakable. So now we are without any capability of introduce effective price control with some exception the French government or the Spanish government who did introduce a price cap on energy with the positive effect of having a much slower extension of inflation to the rest of the economy out of energy prices. And at the same time, as also Manuela said, we, are, we have inherited a model of independent central bank in isolation, uh, which is completely uh, irrelevant for the challenge of, of today's uh, crisis. By the way, there is a fundamental difference. In the statute of the Federal Reserve, the, the mandate is uh, to fight inflation and to ensure full employment. And uh, uh, our friend Galbraith was uh, one of the authors of this uh, change in, in writing. In the case of the European Central Bank, written in uh, neoliberal times, there is only the, the target of uh, controlling inflation. Um, at the same time, when we have a real economic crisis, as in COVID, uh, uh, and an energy crisis, as in the uh, last two years, we are basically without a, a, a set of effective policy tools to address this issue. So what happens is that the only response has come from the change of monetary policy, the, the only visible high-profile response with the shift from zero interest rates and quantitative easing to 4% uh, interest rates and monetary restrictions. This is a key political and policy issue. There is a risk of a recession, a crisis of finance, uh, the excessive debt. But at the same time, we do not have a space, a political space, where this debate can go on. There, there may be some debate in the closed rooms of the European Central Bank uh, or the uh, Bank of International Settlements, but uh, uh, this is not something which can be discussed in parliaments in the public opinion. So the question is that a lot of things are changing, but we, don't have, we do not have a, a, a space where this debate uh, can, can uh, be, be discussed. I skip, um, I think one key element that is behind both your story is the fact that uh, the last uh, 40 years have been a period of massive financial accumulation. The mod capitalism has expanded through a model of uh, financial accumulation, not uh, through a model of real economy expansion. And, uh, you can see some, some of these data. The Dow Jones uh, industrial average increased tenfold from uh, Paul Volcker time to today. Um, in uh, relationship to US GDP, the stock market capitalization has, uh, uh, has increased five times. So we are talking about a massive financial bubble, which is draining resources from the real economy, and is clearly a, a major danger of uh, brings with it, uh, as we have seen in 2008, a major danger of financial instability. But this is not what uh, the uh, macroprudential regulation are talking about. And this is not what uh, the impact of inflation is being discussed, because inflation could be a way out of uh, the risk of a bubble, because it deflates financial values in real terms. But this is, there is no discussion about this. So um, if we take seriously the importance of uh, uh, financial accumulation, we have uh, 
Jonathan Levis, uh, the uh, Chicago economic historian, who was here a couple of years ago presenting his book, Ages of American Capitalism. And his argument is that uh, we live in an age of, uh, of uh, chaos in the US with asset price inflation as the mainstream model of generation of income and wealth. And everything uh, develops in the US. I think uh, this could be a very interesting perspective for uh, putting a context, uh, your analysis in context. Uh, we can skip uh, a lot of details about uh, the Italian uh, case. Uh, you can see the Italy's and Euro areas inflation, um, uh, the total inflation for consumption and uh, the core inflation eliminating energy prices. So this shows that uh, this inflation in Europe is not an issue of monetary policy, of excessive money supply, it's an issue of energy inflation, imported energy prices, which have been transferred with a delay to the rest of the economy because there is a, been a surge by firms to uh, protect profits, and uh, uh, all, all analysis in the US, in the European Central Bank, and so on, show that it is, we are now living a period of profit-driven inflation, now that the energy prices have been going down. But we are not uh, uh, monitoring profits, we are not uh, protecting real wages, and so we are in a situation where the extension of, uh, of the inflation uh, dynamics uh, is having a distributive impact of a significant uh, scope. About 15% of real wage uh, have been lost over these two years, increasing inequality because uh, the uh, prices of energy and uh, food are uh, uh, more important for the poorer part of the population, and, and uh, uh, there is uh, um, some, a lot of evidence of a long-term fall of real wages, but we can skip these arguments. Um, so what is to be done? Uh, if the causes of inflation are, in order, energy and profits, we have to have tools which address energy and profits, not overall demand. Uh, we need additional policies protecting labor and real wages, and clearly we need a major coordination of macroeconomic, fiscal, and monetary policy at the aggregate level, but also specific real economy action, environmental uh, policies addressing climate change and replacing fossil fuels with uh, um, renewable energies, because unless we do this, we will continue to be exposed to the vagaries of uh, energy prices. And we need industrial policy to develop alternative capabilities. Uh, so we don't, uh, the, need, the experience of the quantitative easing was that there was zero interest rates, but firms did not make investment. Uh, Saraceno can, can add something on, on this investment dimension. So we need specific actions that can help real economy recover. So what are we doing as a matter of fact? The goal of the central banks is still the idea of a return to 2% inflation and that they are prepared to increase interest rate and reduce money supply uh, until this goal is obtained in the medium, short, medium term, but uh, there ha had been an important debate in, in times of deflation with Blanchard, Stiglitz, and many others saying this is nonsense, we should have a, a, a two, uh, sorry, a three or four percent target uh, in order to allow more room for the economy and to accommodate, for instance, the defl the the deflation of the financial bubble and uh, weaken the, the negative impact of restrictive uh, policies. We have now all European countries uh, on the, uh, uh, with expectation of growth uh, around zero in the, in the next uh, year, and so we, the risk of deflation and recession is, is, is uh, uh, rather serious. But at the same time, we have a good news with the fact that the experience of the suspension of the Growth and Stability Pact during the pandemic has allowed a massive fiscal policy response to the crisis of demand and supply. So we had a very positive lesson from the, the pandemic experience. Uh, all countries, European countries, Italy, the US, increased the public expenditure to GDP ratio by 10 percentage point, a massive increase, okay? Uh, and this uh, short-term fiscal policy shock allowed a, a quick recovery after the death of the recession. 
uh, with the closure of COVID. So uh, fiscal policy was effective, but was effective when European uh, treaties were suspended, and now we are risking a return of uh, restrictive uh, constraints. So monetary and fiscal policy together uh, worked, but, but not by design, but by, by chance in a way, uh, working together were uh, helping us to recover after the uh, COVID uh, recession. Um, we clearly need additional tools. Some price and market controls are in order. We should stop believing that uh, the TFF uh, were uh, futures uh, uh, prices of uh, gas uh, is an efficient market. This is a uh, financial speculation which has nothing to do with the uh, acquisition of real gas supplies and uh, sh we should not uh, have our consumer prices set by this type of uh, financial speculation. Um, also, um, we can skip uh, this. Um, in conclusion, I think uh, this uh, phase of inflation challenges us on a number of uh, traditional approaches, for instance, uh, the need, uh, more generally, the need for a, a, a broader coordination, not just of uh, fiscal and monetary policy, but also of uh, a combination of uh, specific price policies, industrial policy, environmental policy, in order to address the challenges that are specific for uh, Europe, which are different from the challenges that uh, other countries in the US are having. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mario. And we finish this book, book uh, uh, part with Francesco uh, Saraceno. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. The advantage of being last and not having slides is that I can uh, uh, take stock of much that has been said, especially because actually I, many of the things that uh, were said before resonate with what I wanted to discuss with you. So I'm also here because I wrote a book, it's in Italian, and it's a book that, uh, uh, and I would like to start from actually how I decided to write this book, because I think it's a good way for, for me to tell you what, what I think of all this inflation uh, debate. Uh, the idea actually was to write a pamphlet, a short book that I was supposed to come out in just a few weeks. It took me seven months to write it, and it's not a pamphlet, it's 200 pages. Um, and because I'm not capable of writing pamphlet, basically. Uh, the, the, and my, my point, the point I wanted to make with this uh, essay was really to try to fight the uh, narrative that was coming out of the debate on inflation in, in, the, in the fall of 2022, 20, uh, uh, which was a narrative that resonated from an old debate that was somehow uh, that's recalled in the two previous presentations. So the idea that uh, inflation is basically an aggregate phenomenon, it's an aggregate phenomenon that stems from the uh, too much money chasing too few goods, to use a, a very famous uh, um, uh, dictum from, from some monetarist economists, I don't even remember, or more famous, the famous Friedman quote by which inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And that these monetary phenomenon should be fought mostly through the, mostly actually only, through the uh, 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 operation of central banks. So the tightening of monetary policy was the way to solve that problem of excessive inflation. That idea, and that is, I come to complete a little bit what was said by Mario, <coughs> and Manuela, is that the economy basically does not need macroeconomic policy to have, to have real convergence because there is a sort of ideal equilibrium, the natural equilibrium, and so the only thing that, that macroeconomic policies can do is to control that demand does not diverge too much, aggregate demand, once again, does not diverge too much from supply, and so uh, that inflation stays more or less on target, which is this famous 2%. So that was the first narrative that came out in the public discourse. That was a narrative that for 10 years had been completely muted because for the previous 10 years, as Manuela was recalling, we lived in a completely different world. We had hit a wall in 2008 uh, with the global financial crisis and this old paradigm I was just mentioning had kind of lost credibility. So for 10 years it went underground and it seems actually that 
there was a process of rethinking macroeconomics that would make that paradigm obsolete. In, two, in 2022, uh, it became apparent that the paradigm was alive and kicking. Will it eventually win? I don't know, but it, would, was, certainly, it was certainly alive and kicking. Then, of course, if you, if you notice the things that Mario uh, mentioned in his presentation, if you notice that inflation was actually a very exogenous phenomenon in this case, very structural, very linked to specific things, uh, the, uh, I will come back to that in a moment, but mostly the supply side of the economy and the energy prices, the answer would be yes, but whatever, regardless, regardless of these of the source of inflation, monetary policy still needs to be restrictive because if, it, if, it's, if it's not, we'll go over the 1970s again. Uh, as I said, the 70s were taken as the example of what should not be done, meaning let inflation run, even if the sources are on the supply side of the economy, because that will uh, trigger a sort of uh, 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 the anchoring of expectations. People, uh, agents would embed these uh, expectations of high inflation into their contract and then a, a wage price spiral would happen like in the 70s once again and that would lead to a, an, a, 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 a sort of a chronicization of inflation even if it's due to temporary uh, factors. Um, this narrative that emerged and actually guided most of the public discourse and eventually led to the monetary tightening of 2022, of the spring 2022, in my, uh, uh, I mean, I, I try to contrast that narrative with a much more structural definition of inflation. And, uh, and uh, of course, I don't invent it. There, are, uh, there, are, there have been lots of economists who have been working on the uh, sectoral um, explanation of inflation. So inflation has the sum of sectoral imbalances of different signs. Not many people know that even at the height of inflation in the fall of 2022, we had around 6% of the goods of the Eurostat basket that actually had uh, uh, decreasing prices. So they were experiencing uh, sectoral deflation, basically. Um, and that the, um, the sectoral imbalances uh, converge into an, an aggreg aggregate inflation rate that actually doesn't mean much. And we should really look at the sectors rather than looking at the uh, aggregate, okay? And so this is my, uh, the, the project of the book. Try to contrast the first narrative I told you with the second uh, narrative. And I try to do it by going back and forth within three levels. The first is the history of ideas. There is a discussion of this idea of the natural rate. There is a discussion of the Phillips curve and how it has been used in the debate to justify uh, different uh, policies. There is a discussion, a sort of uh, uh, level, which is the history of facts. I revisit both the 1970s and the Great Moderation, arguing that A, the 1970s were not as bad as people usually believe, and that the Great Moderation was actually not as good as people, people, people believe for the reasons that actually were evoked even this morning in the discussion on the uh, Bank of Italy, the fact that this macroeconomic stability, in fact, was one of the things, not the only thing, that fed the financial instability that eventually led to the crash of 2007 and 2008. And the last level, of course, on which I uh, uh, base my analysis is the current inflationary episode and the comment of policy, of policy uh, choices, okay. There are, in my opinion, two big advantages of uh, of rejecting the aggregate definition of inflation and focusing on a more, more structural and sectoral definition. The first is that contrary to the aggregate, to the aggregate uh, definition, once you adopt a structural definition of inflation, uh, it's much easier to assess costs and benefits of inflation because these costs and benefits are mostly distributional, uh, distributional effects, and these distributional effects are, much, are easily, easily understood if we uh, focus on the microeconomic level. For example, the different composition of the consumption baskets of rich and poor households. For example, the difference between sectors in which profit rates increases and sectors in which they don't increase, et cetera, et cetera. So once we abandon the aggregate definition of inflation, it's much easier to put at the center of the analysis the distribution of costs and benefits of policies in general, and in particular of uh, e uh, inflation. So th that would be the first reason why it is much better, in my opinion, to abandon the aggregate definition. And the second, uh, it's more general, it goes well beyond uh, the, uh, the debate on inflation, and it's a little bit linked to what uh, Mario was saying towards the end of his presentation, is that if we 
uh, stop focusing on, agri on the aggregate dimension of inflation, it's much easier to understand what is happening in, man in, in monetary, in macroeconomic policy in general. And I mean, I, I, it's also something that came out from Manuela's presentation. We, we are today uh, evolving towards a, a, a paradigm on macroeconomic policy that is not even actually macroeconomic policy. It becomes economic policies in which you have uh, monetary policies, fiscal policy, industrial policies, uh, income policies, so a number of tools that are used to address uh, problems and uh, policy objectives that have multiple uh, sources and multi multiple causes. And so uh, if you keep the analysis at the aggregate level, it's much harder to actually find this complexity both in the problems that policy should address and the solutions that policy should uh, find. And so I think that, I mean, the discussion of the two previous speakers actually helped me make this point. And so that is actually, by, by the way, the reason of the, of the title of the book. I mean, it, it started as against central banks to try to sell a little bit more of COVID, and then I say that against central banks was not exactly what I was arguing for. I was more arguing that we should go beyond central banks and adopt a multi tool and multi-instrument uh, approach to policy. <clears throat> okay. uh, notice that this new paradigm is, a, a, is quite a break from the previous, what, uh, 70 or 80 years of debate on macroeconomic policy. Both the Keynesian side, if you want, the Keynesian theory that dominated until the late 70s, and the new neoclassical theory, new consensus, uh, call it as you want, that came after that, basically were uh, built around the uh, Timbergen principle. So the idea that you should allocate an instrument for every policy objective and then go with that. Okay? And this is something that is clearly not working today, has not been working during deflation when central banks were left alone by governments, especially in Europe, to try to fight deflation. And they had a hard time bringing the inflation rate uh, back up, and it's of course not working now when monetary policy is, and that will be my next point, not for the moment at least being very effective in, in, in uh, curbing inflation, other tools should be much more, should be used because much more effective. <clears throat> okay, so, and that, uh, so, uh, that leads me to what, what has been happening. So, sectoral perspective, and then it's quite clear, and I, I can repeat what Mario said, so be very fast on that, we had COVID. COVID had, of course, a strong impact from the aggregate point of view, but it also has a very, had a very a specific impact, specific of that crisis, which was a sectoral reallocation of demand. So we had a general drop of production and aggregate demand, and within the drop of aggregate demand, there was a sectoral reallocation from sectors to others. Some sectors were uh, squarely shut down from the economy, so demand and supply went to zero. Uh, for uh, a long period. This reallocation of demand was partially temporary. It was reversed as soon as the economy restarted. Partially ten ended up being much more persistent, possibly permanent. Think, for example, of the, these tools that we are having here, like uh, the teleconferencing and, and things like that. And it's very unclear how much the, the sector composition of demand will be different in two, three, four years from what it was in 2019. It's impossible to say, but certainly there was this re, uh, recomposition. This recomposition played a role also when the economy restarted, because when, when, the, when we got out of the lockdown and there was a strong departure of the economy, much stronger than many forecasters actually anticipated, what happened is that supply couldn't follow, because the uh, the reallocation of demand, of course, uh, could not immediately be matched by the re reallocation of uh, supply. And so we had the bottlenecks, we had the supply chains disruptions, we had all the containers blocked in, in, different, in different ports. We had, of course, the crisis that, I mean, did not end for all countries. China went into selective lockdowns all, all the way into 2021, and so this, of course, created disruption. And this disruption led to tensions at the sectoral level that eventually uh, uh, became an aggregate uh, uh, upward pressure on prices. On top of that, the energy crisis. On top of that, only as an amplifier, not an, as an initial source, the uh, crisis, the crisis, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, and the result is a, an inflation rate that drops. The initial reaction of central banks is, in my opinion, quite good. Uh, for the whole of 2021, 
uh, and uh, early 2022, central banks uh, keep cool, if you want, and stay vigilant. So the idea is we recognize that this is not an aggregate demand supply, this is not an excessive money supply uh, inflation, and so we don't intervene, we just stand ready to uh, intervene in case it is necessary. Things change, probably they get, they get into panic mode, probably because of the uh, invasion of Ukraine, that kind of makes the shock more uh, persistent. And so first the Fed in, in, in March, and then uh, in July the ECB follows, starts the tightening that is still going on uh, uh, today. Uh, inflation is going down. Some people have been saying, look, this, this is proof that monetary policy has been working. I tried to spend a few pages in the book quoting all the literature that shows that the lags of monetary policy are too important for the drop of inflation to be explained by monetary policy. Basically, the literature is quite, uh, it's quite uh, unanimous in arguing that it, it, you need at least 12 to 18 months in order to start seeing the effect of monetary tightening. So the impact of monetary tightening on inflation should start to be seen around now, and inflation has been going down for the past year since the peak was in the September 2022. So there, were, there, there has been one year of inflation reduction that is probably due to the fact that these temporary factors were, yes, persistent, more than we anticipated, but remained temporary. So eventually they actually faded uh, away. <clears throat> Uh, and so what was the impact? What is the impact of this monetary tightening that happened uh, e even if it did not immediately affect inflation? Well, first of all, it will eventually affect inflation. So nobody doubts, I don't doubt at least, that eventually the impact of monetary tightening on inflation will appear. So the monetary tightening will slow down demand, even if the problem was that supply went down. <laughs> uh, 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 and so the, the problem was a supply side problem, it's, it's enough to bring demand below the low level of supply and eventually uh, the uh, demand constraint will bite and inflation will go down. So I'm, I don't have any doubt that the monetary tightening will eventually go lead to a drop of inflation. The problem is that this will come at a cost. The cost will be, of course, that the way to have this, this inflation is to induce a slowdown of the economy, recession or not recession, it's not a debate I am passionate about. It's enough for me to say that there will be a, a uh, slowdown of the economy. The second important impact, once again, is the distribution. Not everybody is affected in the same way by the, by the uh, drop of, uh, by the uh, increase of interest rates, and so there is a problem of the distribution. Who paid for inflation and who's paying for this inflation? Uh, and then there is a, a possible, I mean, uh, uh, undesirable uh, uh, long-term effect of this monetary tightening, it, it, it was mentioned uh, quickly by Mario, it is that the drop, uh, I mean, the uh, main impact of monetary tightening is on long-term expenditure, on basically investment. Huh? And if the problem is structure, if the problem is of supply that, that has a hard time adapting to the new, new composition of demand, it's not the best of ideas to actually hamper this recomposition of supply by uh, curbing investment. So the risk is that the monetary tightening uh, is an obstacle to re the recomposition of the productive uh, capacity of the economy at the sectoral level. On top of that, it may, I might also be a, an obstacle to the, uh, because <laughs> let's not forget that this series of shock we've been experiencing in the past uh, 15 years happen on the background of a necessary structural transformation of our economies, which is the ecological and digital transition, and so it might actually also hamper that. And that could be paradoxically be inflationary in the medium term, because if we delay the exit from fossil fuels, probably as these fossil fuels, we, because of regu uh, regulation, because of decreased demand, become more uh, expensive, the risk is that we will end up having more inflation because of this monetary tightening. So there is, we risk paying the lower inflation today with higher inflation pressures uh, tomorrow. <clears throat> so what should have been done? Mario already mentioned that. A using, a, I mean, addressing a multi-source, multi-causes uh, multi uh, 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 sectoral problem through a multi-instrument multi, uh, uh, surgical approach. And this can be much better be done 
through other tools of the government, which is fiscal policy, than monetary policy, which is by definition a one-size-fits-all policy. And so uh, there has been a quite interesting debate on the merits and the flaws of a, a number of instruments. I'm talking about price controls, I'm talking, I'm talking about industrial policies, I'm talking about income policies to try to, to rebalance the costs and benefit. Uh, I'm, talk I'm talking about tackling the rents that appear because of inflation that uh, can be tackled, for example, by the with the taxation of windfall profits, and so on and so forth. Now, I, all these policies uh, have an impact at different horizons and take different time to be implemented. You cannot expect to have these policies to impact the economy right away. It's quite hard because when you target in a surgical way, it's much, hard, it's much easier to actually get it wrong. For example, if you think of all the distortions you can introduce in the economy by introducing price controls, you need to be very cautious in the way you do it. That said, the fact that this is difficult doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. I always, uh, I always quote an apologue that, uh, of the drunken guy uh, searching the keys under the lamppost, and when you say, can I help you? Yes, but I didn't lose them here, I lose them there. Why don't you look for them there? Because there, there is no light. Okay, so the fact that, we, that monetary policy is simpler to implement doesn't mean we should use it if it's wrong to implement it. Okay, so that is, for me, quite an important, uh, quite an important point to be made. Let me conclude with two general conclusions that go well, be, well beyond inflation, and that actually also these kind of resonate with what was said before. First, at the heart of the debate of inflation and disinflation, there is the issue of distribution. Uh, it came out almost endogenously in my book. I didn't start with that in mind. It came out exposed. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's actually quite fascinating for me how this thing grew in my hands, quite different from what I had planned at the beginning. And what is also striking is that in the end, the costs and benefits always go on the same categories. Uh, I, one of, I, I titled one of the sections of the book, It's Raining Stones, to, to quote a book by, uh, a film by um, Ken Loach. Uh, when things go well, the rich get richer. When things go bad, the poor get poorer. That is basically what's happening today. So I think we have a problem for the organization of our societies that is such that whatever macroeconomic shock or whatever public policy is implemented, the benefits always go to the same people uh, or categories and the, 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 and, the, and the costs go on the same category. So we need to really rethink the organization of our societies, because eventually this will lead to a deterioration of the, of the social contract. And it's actually leading to that. I mean, my interpretation of the gilets jaunes in France, I live in France, my interpretation of the gilets jaunes is really the middle class that says, enough of always asking us to pay for everything. So there is a problem of social contract that is threatened by this, uh, this organization that we have now. The second uh, and last point I would like to make is that the these past 15 years, not just this inflationary episode, have shown the importance of reassessing the policy mix that was said by both Manuela and Mario. Fiscal policy is back in town. It was ejected from the toolbox of policymakers for 30 years, and now it's back in town. It has been back in town at the beginning in a very classical uh, Keynesian role of stabilizing aggregate demand. What is very fascinating is that since then, it has been called for, for fiscal policy to foster both public and private investment, so to, uh, to try to, uh, to, to boost potential growth and long-term growth. And in the very recent episode, it has been evoked and partially used, not enough in my opinion, also to fight inflation. So we have fiscal policy to fight inflation, not monetary policy. And what is fun is that it is expansionary fiscal policy to tame inflation. So you need to spend money, for example, by the allocating resources. You have to spend money to have, to have a deficit to actually decrease inflation. And this goes, of course, against the conventional wisdom that deficit is conducing to, uh, to inflation. So there is this, uh, this new paradigm that is, that is emerging that is if it will be consolidated after this episode, because as I said before, the old paradigm is actually very, very much alive and kicking, in which you have no more dichotomies between short and long run. You have no more dichotomies between demand-side policies and supply-side policies. You have no more dichotomies between macroeconomic and structural policies. And policies really become a 
so you have no more uh, Kuhnbergian principle. I think this is quite interesting for somebody like me who has been studying the history of thought and the history of economics, because if that happens, if that is consolidated, we may enter into a new world which will be very different from the world of the 70s, of the 50s, 60s, when Keynes was dominant, and very different of the, let me use a label I don't like, of the neoliberal world we have been living since the 80s. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now, uh, uh, to paraphrase this latest, uh, this last book, Beyond the, uh, the Central Banks, we do the opposite. We, do, we go beyond the academic analysis, and we give the floor to the Central Bank, uh, uh, to somebody working in the Central Bank, uh, <laughs> of Italy, Martina Ceccioni, for uh, uh, an assessment and a view on uh, the, 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 the ideas that have been presented so far. So, uh, yes, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for inviting me to read this book that uh, gave me a fresh uh, perspective from my side uh, on, on all issues regarding both inflation, monetary policy, and institutions. Uh, what I would like to bring into the discussion is somehow the perspective from the central bank point of view on the recent uh, inflationary episodes uh, and the consequent response of monetary policy. And uh, so um, uh, you, you're going to see some data and some uh, analysis that we did at Banca d'Italia during the last uh, two years, more or less, uh, where we were, in, we were in the front line to tackle uh, the, these uh, extraordinary inflation uh, shocks. So um, uh, briefly, my, out, my, my talk would be uh, would talk a little bit about this uh, recent episode of inflation surge that has been quite extraordinary, as I will uh, say later. Then I will concentrate a little bit on what was the ECB monetary policy response to it. And finally, I'll try to give you some uh, idea of how this monetary policy has been transmitting so far through banks and financial markets. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll try to conclude on what uh, we, we, we need to expect uh, in, the, uh, in the coming months uh, and years. Um, let me start with uh, a graph that we have already seen uh, from the presentation of Mario. What we see is that the euro area headline inflation surged to double digit figures uh, in uh, October 2022. We, we reached the historical record of 10.6%. Uh, uh, you see it uh, on the left hand side, uh, uh, the blue line. Also, core inflation that has been quite flat during the, since the, the, the beginning of the monetary. Union spiked up uh, uh, a little bit later than uh, headline inflation and reached uh, a peak uh, uh, in March 2023 uh, of 5.7% uh, uh, and turned out to be much more persistent so far than headline inflation. What we see from the left-hand side picture is that this rise in inflation has been more or less uh, um, uh, as regarded all uh, components of inflation. However, with different timing and with different characteristics. So um, what I will try to do uh, is to try to sh show you the analysis that we did in order to understand what was really driving inflation uh, in these extraordinary times. Uh, we identified mainly three uh, components. One of it, uh, we already uh, discussed about it in the previous two presentations, is the unprecedented shock to energy commodity that started since uh, 2021. There has been supply and demand imbalances in the oil market. As the economy was reopening, there was a large demand for uh, oil, uh, and at the same time, a weaker recovery in the production. This led to a uh, very low inventories in the oil market that leads to a very sharp uh, increase in prices uh, already in 2021. Uh, a similar pattern we observed for the gas market, which was something that we didn't care too much before the last uh, two years. So we didn't have in our projection, for example, uh, gas prices as a relevant uh, exogenous variables. And uh, since 2021, gas prices increases as well. And here uh, also the reopening of the economies was relevant, the adverse weather condition, and the acceleration of coal, uh, uh, of the substitution of coal with gas by, uh, by China. Then uh, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, started in 2022, and this added further pressure to, gas, uh, to both gas and oil prices. 
So what we see is an incredible spike in energy inflation uh, uh, since 2021. And uh, this is uh, unprecedented since the, European, the, the, the start of the monetary union, but uh, has been experienced before in the 70s. So some colleagues of mine, Corsello, Gomellini, and uh, Pellegrini, tried to understand what, the, what are the differences in terms of uh, institutional uh, features uh, of the economies in the euro area um, in the 70s as now and identified uh, three uh, differences uh, with respect to current situation. First of all, uh, the central bank independence. Uh, we have talked about it uh, a lot uh, in the first two presentations. Then some structural feature of the labor market. And finally, fiscal policy rules. The second factor that has affected the inflation in our view uh, during the 2021 and later on is the supply bottlenecks. Here, uh, Francesco already gave uh, some perspective on these. These are, uh, what I show here, are several indicators that we have been monitoring to understand how much these um, uh, supply problems uh, were affecting the prices uh, and production. And what we see is that, uh, especially in 2021, we observe increasing disruption in the production and transportation of goods that was uh, exacerbated by a shift in the demand of manufacturing goods. Some economies were, all, uh, uh, were closed to lockdown, so the demand was, most, uh, uh, sub, was most, um, mostly uh, towards goods and not towards services. Uh, we still fear the contact, uh, as you may remember. Now there's a third factor uh, that uh, it's important to, take, to, to, to be taken into account in uh, explaining what, what happened to inflation, and it's the post-pandemic reopening. And uh, as the economy is exactly reopened, the consumers turn back to services. And what we have here now, it's uh, an increase uh, in 2022 of uh, some selected uh, service. So you see that inflation is started to increase also uh, on, uh, on this item. Um, uh, excess savings uh, since uh, the COVID, the pent-up demand uh, and the return to social contact coupled with these uh, incredible increases in input prices uh, was uh, like a unique occasion for raising prices and so uh, led to uh, the, the, the spike of inflation that we have seen that was quite broad-based as I, I was trying to argue. Now, uh, given these three factors, we, we wanted to understand what is the, um, the relative importance uh, of the three of them uh, in uh, shaping uh, uh, inflation, because the response of monetary policy can be very different uh, if uh, uh, the, the inflation is driven by supply shocks and by demand shocks. And what we did in an occasional paper is to look at energy shocks in particular, but also at other shocks and inflation, and try to disentangle uh, whether inflation was driven mostly by energy and supply shock or by these uh, post-pandemic reopenings in a way. Now, I will skip all this uh, formula. It's just uh, that we had an empirical approach to try to get from the data uh, a disentangle of these uh, forces. And the first exercise that I show you here um, uh, indicates that uh, not only inflation was affected directly uh, by uh, the increase in energy prices, and this is the, the red bar that you see here, but there has been a, a strong pass-through of uh, energy prices to other items like, uh, I don't know, services uh, or uh, food inflation uh, that has been non-negligible. And this pass-through has been higher than in previous uh, uh, period. So this unprecedented shock to energy created also an unprecedented transmission to other uh, items. And uh, I have some number years, but uh, we evaluated at the end of 2022, when uh, inflation was uh, at its peak, that uh, around 60% of inflation was driven uh, by uh, this direct and direct effect of energy. Uh, in an additional exercise, we try then to uh, disentangle demand and supply shock, including not only energy prices, but also these supply bottlenecks 
that we have uh, talked about before. And also here, if you look at the third panel, that is the contribution of this uh, supply and demand shock on inflation, you see that uh, um, uh, a lot of it, uh, the lion's share in the, the, in the increase in inflation has been uh, aggregate uh, supply shock. Uh, aggregate demand has started to play some role when the economy reopened and when there has been this uh, service uh, uh, increase uh, in inflation, uh, but it was uh, uh, quite a smaller compared to, uh, to, to, to headline inflation. Now, uh, I tried to argue that uh, inflation was due to unprecedented shock in, the, in these recent episodes and uh, an additional uh, confirmation that uh, what, what's happening? <laughs> okay, uh, an additional confirmation of uh, this, uh, this, com this uh, exceptional shock uh, is that uh, this uh, mm, inflation uh, become really difficult to forecast for central bankers. What you have on the left hand side are the uh, ECB and Eurosystem staff projection of headline inflation. So uh, the, the um, uh, the orange line is what we were predicting in December 2021, and then you see that we had to adjust our projection as we move forward. And uh, it's not just the institutional sector that was wrong uh, in predicting inflation, it was also analysts, private analysts and uh, professional forecasts that made this uh, uh, projection error. So at the Bank of Italy, we asked ourselves uh, what was happening, uh, why we had this large projection error. Now, uh, the, 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 the right-hand side picture uh, uh, in 2022 shows that we were projecting an inflation in January 2021 for Italy, uh, that is the red the dot, and, we realize, and the realized inflation was this one. So through the lens of the Bank of Italy quarterly econometric model, we managed to uh, try to understand what was uh, behind these projection errors. And almost 90% of the outward pressure on consumer prices came from um, much higher expected growth of international prices. So, so this uh, green bar and this energy commodity that uh, made the lion's share. And results are pretty much similar uh, in a similar analysis that uh, the ECB did. Uh, now, the impact on inflation for what concerned Italy was uh, uh, partially mitigated but, uh, by government intervention, especially targeted uh, intervention were very crucial uh, in mitigating inflation, and this helped a little bit uh, low-income uh, households. Now, uh, this is a little bit how we analyzed. Let's look at the ECB monetary policy response. And, uh, uh, Given this unprecedented shock, uh, you, you can imagine that also the reaction of the ECB has been quite unprecedented uh, if compared to past cycle. So what you see here is the cumulative change of ECB policy rates, and the red one is the current tightening cycle that compares uh, 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 with uh, the, the two other tightening cycles we had since uh, the, the, the European Monetary Union, which were much more gradual and uh, less consistent. We had 40, uh, four, um, 450 basis point increases in 10 months, and this is quite exceptional. Uh, at the same time, the Eurosystem balance sheet has been shrinking, uh, as we were saying before. Uh, now, all these uh, strange acronyms are the, whole, the, the, the large number of programs that during the deflationary periods were uh, uh, activated uh, uh, and uh, that are now in a legacy uh, on the Eurosystem balance sheet. But what you see now is that uh, starting from 2022, uh, the, the decline uh, on the Eurosystem balance sheet has been quite consistent, uh, quite, uh, quite substantial. It's uh, more than uh, almost two trillion. Uh, how markets uh, and analysts understood uh, our reaction function and this exceptional um, increase in interest rate. Uh, what you see on the left hand side, it's a, a forthcoming uh, paper by my uh, colleague Vincenzo Cuciniello, uh, in which um, he uh, tried to analyze how markets were viewing the response uh, of the interest rates of the policy rate uh, by the ECB to inflation surprises. And you see that uh, uh, there has been a, an increase in the aggressiveness uh, uh, of the policy rate as it was perceived by the market. And there is another paper by my colleague that shows that this analyst revision of the expected policy rate path resulted mostly from this upward revision that they had as well on the, uh, on the inflation outlook. 
uh, where we are now, uh, uh, what I'm plotting here, here are real interest rates, and uh, uh, what you can see is that uh, looking at all the horizon from now to uh, in 10 years, uh, interest rates are now in restrictive territory and are positive. And uh, this compares to uh, how was uh, the situation before uh, the, 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 the inflationary episode, and you see that in end 2021 they were all negative as a result of, this, uh, of the deflationary uh, uh, period that the, the central bank had to face. Now, um, the impulse of monetary policy has been quite strong, uh, and it's now transmitting uh, to the rest of the economy. So, uh, as we were saying before, monetary policy works uh, through banks, in the euro area especially, it works through banks uh, and through financial markets. And what we see here is that uh, financing conditions are tightening also for banks. What you have here is the interest rate on the main liabilities uh, of the banks, and you see that uh, the, the, um, uh, the interest rate in both, uh, for banks for in both Italy and the euro area has been increasing uh, quite substantially. The only uh, interest rate that has not been increasing uh, is the one on overnight deposit rates, and this has incentivized the households and firms to move their, invest their investment and their portfolio towards other uh, form of more remunerative um, uh, uh, investments. This financing condition tightening for banks has been transmitted also to uh, households and firms, and I guess that uh, uh, those of you who have a mortgage knows very well uh, what's happening here. Uh, and uh, as a result of this uh, uh, increase, uh, and uh, I'm going to skip this because uh, we do not have too, uh, too much time, as a result of this increasing cost, also the credit volumes uh, uh, have weakened markedly since 2022. And here we have some evidence that the, in, the weakening uh, in credit volumes have been quite stronger uh, than what observed in the past hiking cycle. Uh, so it, it, it seems the case that the banks have been more reactive uh, than what we observed before. Now, given this weak lending, this reduction of the euro system balance sheet and this portfolio recomposition toward the uh, uh, assets that are more remunerative, uh, what we had is that the money, uh, so the monetary aggregate, uh, uh, fell to an all-time low uh, uh, in August. Let me wrap up uh, where we are now. So. Um, uh, we have a situation in which inflation expectation remained well anchored to the 2% objective. So what we have uh, in the plot is uh, long-term inflation expectation, and we expect this long-term inflation expectation to be close uh, to uh, our objective uh, as a measure of the credibility uh, of the ECB to, to reach its target. And we see that uh, what we observed is a re-anchoring uh, of the inflation expectation towards their uh, new level uh, that after the strategy review have been uh, revised to 2%. So uh, the risk that uh, inflation becomes uh, entrenched uh, in a wage and price setting uh, has been uh, um, eliminated in a way uh, so far. So the swift reaction of monetary policy uh, had given, uh, I mean, some fruit in this dimension. Uh, for what concerns headline inflation, so non, not uh, expectation on inflation in 10 years, but uh, inflation that we will observe uh, in the next year, uh, we see from uh, um, the ECB projection that this is expected to converge toward the 2% in 2025. Now, uh, connecting to what Francesco was saying before, uh, this uh, drop uh, in inflation that we already observed, uh, it's indeed uh, uh, the undo of the, 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 the large energy shock that we had in the first place. So the effects of monetary policy uh, are going to be uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this period, so are not there yet. It's, uh, it's in the projection, let's say. Um, uh, this is true also for core inflation, which has been, uh, as I said before, a little bit more persistent. Here we have some leading indicators of core inflation, and uh, using their leading properties, we can say that uh, we are projecting that uh, in, two, in the course of 2023 and 2024, they are going to uh, uh, go down uh, as well. 
uh, wrap up, uh, final wrap up. Uh, so uh, we had exceptional shock that, that led to a record surge of inflation in the euro area. The response of the ECB was quite unprecedented and it was quite effective in anchoring inflation expectation. This uh, monetary policy tightening has been forcefully transmitted to banking and financial markets, so financing conditions are now much more tight than it was uh, before. But uh, uh, a lot of this transmission is still in the pipeline. So for what concerns the effects on the real economy and real activity, we still have to see wh wh what will be the effect. And this, uh, uh, I mean, I share the view that Francesco uh, gave before. It's, uh, it's expected to materialize in the course of this year and especially in the next year. And then later on, on inflation, we can expect that by 2025, uh, uh, the full uh, effects of monetary policy will be there. Now. Uh, as a word of caution, we are in a world of very large uncertainty, and the macroeconomic outlook for the euro area is, uh, uh, of course, affected by that, uh, and uh, uh, we, we see two main uh, risks. Uh, the first risk is that the transmission will turn out to be uh, much more strong than we were expecting, given that we are in a cycle that uh, is quite different than what we observe uh, in history. And the second risk is that there can be, uh, for geopolitical tension, for uh, climate uh, consideration, some renewed upward pressure on prices, uh, on both prices of energy and food, uh, that may make uh, the, the, the job of our central banks uh, even more difficult than, uh, than it is now. So I thank you very much for your attention, and here you have some bibliography. Thank you. Thank you very much for all uh, uh, this data and analysis. I'm very happy now to open uh, the floor. Um, I would say people can ask questions uh, uh, on either the central bank issues or on deflation one. I will try to, uh, to gather a few, a few questions and have the discussion on one topic and on the other one. Please, uh, Professor Zeitlin, and here there is a microphone. Uh, thanks to everybody for a really fantastic uh, panel. So I'm going to just focus a question for Matthias Thiemann. I would also have a question comment for the other papers, but I'll wait for a second bite of the cherry so as not to talk too long. So um, Matthias, I haven't had the benefit of reading the book, but um, uh, listening to you, I have the, uh, the impression that um, you may have been looking to some extent in the wrong place. So from my point of view, big change um, in banking uh, supervision after the crisis is not the macro prudential revolution. Very sexy, but very hard to cash out as you know. But at least in Europe, it is actually um, the intensification of um, microprudential supervision uh, in the Eurozone, where um, single supervisory mechanism acquires really quite substantial new powers uh, over banks. And because it's so large and has, is so comparative, it also can combine the micro and the macro to some extent. And if you, if you want to look at who has been in the forefront of tackling the shadow banking issue, then I would say it is very much uh, the SSM, and they do have powers which they're starting to, to exercise um, to require uh, banks to hold more capital against uh, leverage tackle the linkage uh, to the federal banking sector from that uh, direction. Uh, on the other hand, it also seems to be the case. The financial uh, regulatory authorities generally are becoming more serious about tackling uh, the federal banking sector. And that, I think, is, is uh, you know, largely because of the, uh, the disruptions to uh, money markets, uh, to uh, treasury, uh, markets to pension markets in, in different countries. And, but still, it is uh, certainly the, um, the micro prudential banking supervisors 
who are playing a key part in that even if they are now able to enlist the central banks and uh, the capital markets regulators maybe we will see a more uh, you know years after the global financial crisis maybe we will see a concerted effort to tackle the uh, federal banks i wonder if you would you know how how you would uh, react to that uh, alternative uh, analysis of what has been going on thank you uh, so depending on what you look at maybe the, the central banks can be policemen rather than firefighter after all uh, let alone revolutionaries another question from the back I have a quick question for Manuela and one for Mario. Um, I mean, I really liked your presentation and you know how you brought in that central banks care about their reputation, right, and how they are trying to manage reputational threats. But one thing I didn't hear enough about, and obviously reputation isn't a homogenous thing. You can have very different reputations, right? So different people in the bank may care about the reputations amongst government officials. Others may care about the reputation amongst financial practitioners. Others yet care about the reputation in the public. And often the kind of action that require a particular shot will require will lead to increases and decreases in those respective reputations. So how do those reputational conflicts play out in your mind? My question for Mario, I mean, I've heard this a lot of times, but why do you think the Fed has a broader mandate than the ECB. I mean, you heard this a lot, but to me, I mean, that's just nonsense, right? Article 127 on the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union clearly references Article 3 on the Treaty of Europe, and the Treaty of Europe clearly says that the aim of the ECB is, you know, full and stable inflation, balanced economic growth, protection of the environment. So, how do you get away with saying that it's not at all a mandate of the of the European Central Bank? Thank you. Is there any other further question or so far? You have a question. <laughs> uh, oh, there is a second round. Oh, it is a good, a good one. Should I go for first? Uh, Jonathan, please add, add one. Add one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's yeah, I thought there might be more more questions. So I, I, now I want to address the the uh, other set of papers, which actually really speak very closely uh, to each other. And I think the way to start is uh, in terms of the relationship between, shall we say, ideational change, reputational concerns, and political pressures shaping the as factors shaping the, the central bank's uh, reactions. And uh, there is, the, you build, Manuel, on this broader literature about uh, bureaucratic uh, or regulators' concerns for their reputations, which indeed raises the questions, concerns about reputation among uh, whom. Um, but I think, I mean, the way you, you present the evolution of the ECB's uh, is, and to a lesser extent, the, the Fed is also a concern for how they're viewed uh, by the public and public criticism and resentment, uh, which also feeds into the political system of what uh, central banks uh, have been doing. But then, I mean, a lot of what you're actually talking about um, is the adoption of more heterodox uh, policies and uh, remedies or instruments, especially um, in, after the Euro crisis and in, re in response uh, to COVID. And it did look for a period as if there was also um, you know, an intellectual shift. And this is something that's what you also uh, alluded to. And I, I think about uh, the role of somebody like uh, Isabel Schnabel, uh, who was widely perceived as uh, you know, a figure who represented changes in thinking in central banking and being, was who appointed her, what she stood for. Uh, it, seemed, it seemed like it was a turning point in the outlook of the ECB. And 
before the inflationary shock, she had a very um, uh, elaborate and, and I thought quite interesting um, argument, presentation, or that uh, monetary policy had a whole series of different tools, some of them interest rates, some, uh, some of them uh, to do quantitative easing and tightening, which could be applied to different parts of the financial system. And, uh, you know, there, I was at a conference maybe in 2021 where it was being discussed, was this a move back to the kinds of much more interventionist uh, sorts of policies that French central banks like the French central bank had or the neoliberal era. So then it, it, is a, it has been a little bit shocking to see like that suddenly become uh, monetary hawks. And it does seem like it's concern for their uh, for the reputation of the bank as a um, fighter, that the, the credibility of the bank stake um, in um, gaining commitment to the target, even if the same people uh, cannot say at all that uh, this is work to be effective. Uh, your presentation actually converged very substantially, I thought, with Mario's and Francesco's. It, it told us that the energy price shock was the primary thing. The second round uh, effects were from the energy shock. There was not much uh, effort that, in fact, energy, I mean, price stations um, were becoming unmoored. But then at the end, we're, we're told well, the bank had to do this in order to stabilize uh, expectations. And so that raises the question, I mean, what, what's going on here? Um, why is there this kind of uh, panic about reputation and how does it relate to uh, changing ideas about uh, the, the goals and the instruments of monetary policy and, and economic Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, any other question you always wanted to ask about inflation? I never did. Yes, one? Could be, maybe. Yeah, well, try it first round of uh, I, I try to gather them in, in groups, but yeah, okay. Soon, soon we'll, we'll keep that. I'll keep my question short. I also want to join the others um, and thank you for an excellent stimulus. Very, very timely. Um, one of the decades that came up a lot in the presentation is the 1970s and, and the lessons from the 1970s. And I understood the story, Manu, I was thinking about your presentation in particular, the importance of establishing a reputation. I mean, you can do that in different ways. One is press and debates. Another one is reaching out to academics. Uh, a third way is to, well, change the fabric of your very institution and public relations campaign, as well as how you work with international organizations. So I'm a little curious about, the, so let's say, the institutional dimension of the story. You only had 15 minutes to share your notes, but that amplify that part a little bit. Okay. So we, it, the first question was uh, uh, to Matthias, and it was about you know, different aspects uh, one can look at to, 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 to test the role of central banks. Then we have uh, two kind of questions about reputation and um, you know, commitment to, to credibility and so on, which maybe can be answered together by everybody, and then we finally arrive to, to this one, please. Thank you very much, and uh, I also want to say that I learned a lot, and I want to thank my co for fascinating presentations. Um, I'll first try to answer this particular question, then try to take a swipe at, at, at the larger theme. Particular question, I think, uh, I think you're right to, to start off uh, by saying that the SSM uh, is a substantial strengthening and macro and micro are not in contradiction and shouldn't be thought of in contradiction, at least not for these practitioners. So this is also what I often encounter in the interviews and they're like, you make this distinction, but for us these things go together, they don't contradict each other. Um, I, I think that, so you, you asked an interesting question, is it maybe 15 years later 
that now we see concerted effort to, to deal with shadow banking. Um, first of all, I think that the overall movement in that direction I also observe, and it's something that we will discuss on Friday at the shadow banking workshop, and I think it, it is a very important question. I think I can partially account for it in the context of my uh, theoretical framework, and yet my findings will also partially contradict it. So, uh, co contradict the probability of success of this effort. So the, the how can I account for it is uh, in this book I try to build on the idea of um, variegated change. So some elements change a lot, others change much slower, Kaya and Ray. And, and um, the ideational, or ideational is an academic word, but, but the economics grounds for dealing with shadow banking, I think, have been well established. And not only have they been well established, they have also um, entered into the realm, as you rightly notice, uh, of securities regulators and so on, who now speak the language of shadow banking. So they understand what's going on, and they're more open to these questions. And there's a particularly important constellation in the US today where people that deeply care about shadow banking have been in power or are in power now. So really, I think it's a very unique constellation. But we see the same in Europe, where this is not necessarily the case. So there is an overall trickling through of macroprudential thinking to market regulators, which is a very important development. So this, I think, I can account for in the framework of my book. What I also think at the same time is there is no political pressure. This, I think, is a completely technocratic project. Limiting shadow banking is a technocratic project that currently has no political, there is nobody on the streets saying we have to regulate hedge funds. Or There is also a very limited probability of that, huh? but, but the, it, the, it's not there like it was in 2008. And that's why I think there is a certain political frailty to this project. Um, that means that they might be able to succeed, but what we see in the end is that where we see action is on the banks. Everything else is extremely slow. Everything else is about collecting data, proving that there's a risk from hedge funds, na, 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 na. And because it takes so much time, and it's so politically frail, in the end what they do is they tighten the grip on the banks, where they can do it easily and fast. And that's what they do. And in, in the end, my book is making this summary where it says, shadow banking, nothing, banking quite a lot. And that, that then again fits with this, this observation that where they have a grip, where they have jurisdiction, they try to go out where they don't. Like they, they try to reach into the places where they don't. And so, uh, but it's a, it's, a great, it's a great point. Micro and macro are not in contradiction. The SSM is an, is an evident case in point. So this point is taken. Um, yeah, I wanted to make uh, another uh, a question about this and following up on, on Jonathan's point, and I'll be very quick and shut up then, it's just, would it make sense to think of central banks possibly, like Lakatos did about ideas where he said, you know, you have the outer, the outer element, and then ever more you go to the core, and in the core, do we not find maybe this narrative of expectations, anchoring, and so on, that is, um, where these new ideas haven't reached. And so when the crisis comes, the core is protected. The core needs to hold. And so I'm maybe a little bit less sanguine about this new paradigm. I'm really afraid we're going. Like when I saw Schnabel making this U-turn, I was like, OK. That was good weather talking. And now we're back in, back in bad weather. And bad weather is, is back to the old, sharing some impressions. Okay, thank you. I want to also echo what Makia said. I also thank my co-panelists for the very interesting insights they raised. Um, so I will put together Jonathan and Tobias, and of course we can chat more about this issue of reputation. And Tobias, you are completely right, right? In the book I build from uh, Daniel Carpenter's work of the FDA and the reputation of bureaucratic institutions. And the key thing is that always, you know, an institution, a bureaucracy has to confront multiple audiences. So for me the question is who is the audience that the central bank prioritizes. 
And what I show you, show, I hope I showed in the book, is that this may change over time. And it may change according to the threats that the central bank perceived, right? So at a certain moment, they realized that the biggest threat was coming from these specific audiences that were the political audiences and the public audiences, which was not the case before. So I, I, I speculate in the, in the conclusion so that when we shift from the quiet politics mood to the full crisis moves and, you know, questions become, uh, issues become salient and polarized, then they have to attend to certain audiences that they usually in normal times neglect. So it's, it's completely that point. Um, Orfeo, thank you so much for, for, for the question. Yes, uh, there is also an institutional part in, in establishing a reputation. The story that I tried to tell since the 1970s, so first of all, I think that central banks were extremely uh, lucky because they were helped by governments back in the 1970s. Because uh, if you see the data on the wave of central banks legislation from the 1980s onwards, it's a clear line, you know, when they, countries all over the world, <laughs> you know, they increase the independence of central banks. So first of all, they were helped by government, so that they created the institutional condition. In the book, I recall, uh, you know, this economist, William Buiter, that says, you know, it was a time of cosmic coincidence. What central bankers thought was aligned with what politicians thought, but it was a coincidence. But then, of course, there was the part of the, the operational practice, you know, that central bankers built a particular policy consensus, you know, building, you know, uh, adopting inflation targeting, more or less formal, you know, even non-inflation targeting central banks like the Fed and the ECB, de facto, were doing inflation targeting. You know, the Fed that before the crisis had the dual mandate, but in the end, what they did, they prioritized the price stability mandate, you know, because they wanted to, they, they arrived at the conclusion, if you stabilize prices, everything will fall back in its place. So in the operational practices, they converged, they, they built this reputation that they had to be the, the guardians of money uh, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, I think, I mean, what I, just a note of color here, I mean, I love to look at the uh, economist retrospective on Volcker and Greenspan. They are fantastic, I think, because you, there you could really read, you know, how they were thinking, you know, how they build this reputation, so the lessons that they learned, and they helped build this, uh, this image of themselves, because they were really distilling, you know, certain features of Volcker and of Greenspan, and these are very interesting readers. Uh, but thanks for the questions. Thank you. I think uh, uh, this discussion was uh, very much uh, unexpected in its uh, degree of convergence. Uh, we, we wrote two books which are complementary and basically argue f uh, in, in parallel, but we never discussed them uh, before. And I think the contribution by the Bank of Italy is also interesting. Uh, I had a discussion last week uh, with Salvatore Cors Corsello in, a, in another conference uh, where he presented his uh, impact on uh, inequality. S uh, so the, a lot of the work of the Bank of Italy is actually giving evidence of, of, of a coherent uh, uh, analytical evidence of w what is the impact of these processes. Clearly, uh, what the difference is on the relevance of uh, uh, monetary policy reaction and uh, the cost that uh, these, uh, as a matter of fact, your data on, on uh, banks, uh, loans and investment is terrible. Right? We can anticipate uh, a much uh, harsher uh, slowdown of uh, the Italian and European economy in the light of this uh, prolonged effect. Uh, so in, uh, in this sense, uh, uh, the challenge is really to move a little bit uh, our thinking out of the box of received uh, frameworks, uh, and clearly we understand how difficult it is uh, f when uh, central banks have uh, been shaped by this idea of independence and uh, isolation uh, from the rest of the uh, uh, econ uh, economic debates and also uh, the impact uh, on in terms of economic inequalities and uh, uh, consequences and so on. And clearly, in the case of uh, the European Central Bank, if you look at, uh, at the text, at the declaration and so on, e employment is almost never uh, mentioned. In the case of the uh, uh, Federal Reserve, there is a little bit uh, of lip service to this. So I agree basically with you that there is no sub substantive difference, but uh, from the point of view of status and uh, uh, little tones, th th there may be some 
uh, but clearly linked to the different nature of, of, of the, and clearly to some extent the Fed is much more responsive uh, formally to, to the um, uh, Washington government. So um, I, I think the challenge out, of the, an important lesson out of this uh, afternoon is that what could be the way of uh, reopening a little bit uh, the debate and, and the boxes uh, uh, where we have been putting fiscal policy, monetary policy, industrial policy, price controls, and so on, and uh, help uh, in, uh, these boxes interact uh, and integrate uh, more. Of course, uh, this is a huge challenge from an institutional perspective and from a political perspective, but uh, crises are exactly the t time when new institutions uh, are uh, created and old institutions can reinvent themselves. Thank you. I, well, I join the others in thanking for the questions and the other panelists for this very, very interesting discussion. I would uh, start from the technocratic nature of the central bank and, and the idea of the reputation, and then I will also have a few comments to complete what uh, Mario was saying about the inflation mandate. About Schnabel, uh, later. Uh, so the technocratic nature of monetary policy is not uh, something that falls from the sky. I try to mention it very quickly. Really, the uh, logical consequence of the, of the framework, of the, the, of the theoretical framework that, domi that dominates, dominated, or dominate, maybe I, I also am not very optimistic, uh, since the uh, 1980s. Okay? So the idea that you, uh, you have to uh, you have some sort of natural equilibrium. I was mentioning before this natural equilibrium does not need much government intervention to be reached. Governments can facilitate the convergence to the natural equilibrium, but or they can hamper it with bad policies. But they cannot certainly cannot uh, um, change the natural equilibrium through macroeconomic policies. This is the job of, stru of structural reform and structural policies, and and. That concept leads to a, an idea of policy which is centered around the idea of optimality. So you have optimal policies. You have an optimal uh, level of interest rate, which is the result of a rule. You have an optimal uh, uh, fiscal uh, policy, which is the result of a rule, et cetera, et cetera. And once you are, once you are in the re realm of optimal policy, the next logical step is that you just need to find what the optimal policy is. You can have a computer compute the optimal policy. You don't need choice by policymakers. You need a computation of the optimal equilibrium and the optimal policy. And that, of course, leads to the last step, which is technocrats are much better than politicians because they are much better in finding the optimal policy and implementing it. So the technocratic nature of macroeconomic policy that emerges from the 1980s is no, not random. It's really the obvious child of that view of the world. Uh, of course, it's a completely, a completely uh, mistaken view of the world, I mean, if you ask me, because even the, uh, the idea that by have, and sorry, the inflation objective is a result of that, because once you, are, once you have an optimal policy and you have one instrument, you have only one uh, 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 so, sorry, one objective, uh, I was right before, and you have one instrument, you also have one objective, okay? And so you, you need to, to focus on inflation because, by the way, growth is not your job, it's the job of markets. And notice that in the division of tasks, in the, in the allocation of, of, object, of uh, instruments, you have monetary policy for nominal stability, uh, markets structure for uh, real convergence, and fiscal policy for nothing. And this is why fiscal policy, as I said before, was ejected from the toolbox, right? So that is where, where, where the mandate of the central bank comes. And I, I'm sorry, it is true that there is this sort of, uh, probably introduced by the French uh, 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 mention of the other objectives, sustainable growth, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But the treaties clearly state that these objectives are only the job of the central bank once the main objective of price stability is, is, is obtained. That is clearly stated in the treaties. And that leads to the problem of reputation because de facto, the ECB monetary policy cannot be distinguished from the Fed monetary policy. It was hawkish at times, dovish at times, because they were actually following the Taylor rule. And the Taylor rule has both objectives. And so 
PECB needed to, I mean, why in the, in the Fed, the debate between hawks and doves is somehow transparent? Because the, the, the bank has both objectives. And so it does not need to hide the fact that these objectives need eventually to arbitrate through a political choice, not a technocratic choice. And we go back to the slide I liked very much by Manuela. It's all, monetary policy is always a political policy. It's never, it's never a technocratic choice. The ECB cannot say we have different uh, uh, ways that we put on the, on the different objectives, and so we fight and eventually we reach a consensus. And they needed to hide this debate into a very opaque and non-transparent communication. And there is some literature which I find quite interesting on the, on the problems that this has. I mean, think of Mario, how Mario Draghi had to justify the whatever it takes. He couldn't say this is going to, to uh, the, the, the European economy is, is really going under, uh, under and we need to do something. He said, we, I do the whatever it takes because that is my way to preserve the stability of the euro and the stability of the euro is crucial for, the, for price stability. Who could, who could care about price stability if, if Italy and Spain crashed out of the euro in 2012? But he had to build this whole discourse and this lack of, 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 uh, this lack of uh, transparency, this cumbersome Baroque architecture comes from the fact that a political choice, which is monetary policy, was uh, hidden behind a technocratic curtain. And so I'm very happy that this technocratic curtain actually uh, was there. And this is why, even if the ECB probably cared about growth as much as the Fed in, the, in, in practice, I would like that to be written on paper, because that would make the communication of the central bank much easier. Coming to Schnabel, I don't know, actually, in the book, I mentioned two speeches that she gives in a three months' time span, I think. I actually quote the whole paragraph. The one of the sneeze, uh, the inflation is just a sneeze, so just wait and see. And the other, which you say, oh my God, things are terrible, we need to actually tighten. And bad people argue that it's because he, the, the, the order she receives changed. Of course, I don't know her, I don't know. It's, it's, it's so bad people, very, very bad mouth, and I, and I don't want to speculate because I don't know. And I, say, I, I, I actually think, I actually think that the narrative I was mentioning before in my presentation took, I mean, emerged more forcefully after the, uh, after the invasion. And so it became harder for central banks to ignore it. So we, you know, when, and, and once, and once, once they decided to go that way, they need to find a justification. The, ju the justification was there; it's the narrative. So she basically changed the narrative to justify the change in policy, not vice versa. You should have the narrative that determines policy. Probably there, you had policy determined by narrative. That is how I explain her her U-turn, which, and I'm happy that you said you're not convinced by this new paradigm. I'm not saying I'm not saying that new that this new paradigm I was mentioning before is going to actually end up being the new paradigm. But for the past 10 years, uh, since the world economy crashed in 2008, and so the old paradigm came out in shatters, and we had all these rethinking macroeconomics, I've been asking, so what will happen then? Is there something alternative that can emerge? And I couldn't find it there. We could not go back to the old, uh, old Keynesian theories from the 70s. These were uh, theories that do not work in a global world in which you have capital mobility, so that was, the, 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 the models uh, that uh, Mario was mentioning, we don't find in the data anymore. Uh, so that, that could not be the answer, going back. Uh, I was hoping and still hope that the old natural equilibrium paradigm will eventually be somehow defeated or at least uh, watered down. And I had a hard time thinking of what could be a, a third way, another option. And, and now, in the past few weeks, I mean, these things about this the policy mix only entering the conclusion of my book because it's very recent uh, thinking. Maybe that, sh that should be the way for us to, to, to uh, uh, try to find uh, ways to uh, change our theoretical framework so that we don't have all these dichotomies that characterize these, the old, uh, old mainstreams, which both the Keynesian and the, and the neoclassical one. Uh, which would make, give us a paradigm which is sim more similar to the Keynesian one, because the, in the Keynesian one, the dichotomies were much, much sweeter than in the neoclassical one. But I mean, this is very much preliminary, and I just uh, gave it to you without any uh, pretense to be exhaustive. 
Yes, just a quick reaction on uh, the ECB monetary policy response because we were quite aligned in saying, uh, I mean, the causes uh, of the recent inflationary period. Um, what I think was happening, uh, for example, in the three months uh, of the speeches uh, by Schnabel and in general in monetary policy reaction, is that numbers were changing. So if you look at my graphs on uh, headline inflation and what was going on to gas prices uh, and all the determinants, uh, those were periods in which these numbers were shocking. <laughs> uh, central bank circles that were looking at them uh, quite daily. So uh, the outlook changed quite rapidly. I, I tried to convey this in my presentation, but the, the, we were facing really unprecedented shock. And this was coupled with a situation in which monetary policy was really extensive in, uh, expansive in, uh, uh, since uh, in 2021, we had negative interest rates, uh, uh, the central bank was still uh, doing QE and uh, providing liquidity to banks. So um, we had a very expansionary situation and the central bank didn't want to let's say, throw fools uh, uh, to, in the fire by continuing stimulating aggregate demand. So what we, was necessary to do was bringing uh, monetary policy condition first to neutral and then uh, to be uh, restrictive. And the reason uh, why you, you, you do want to do this is that uh, you risk that these uh, big shocks were, was becoming uh, uh, entrenched uh, in inflation expectation. And this was uh, in a situation in which uh, after the post-pandemic reopening uh, of the economies, uh, we were uh, wanting to go to the restaurant, we were wanting uh, to uh, go out, uh, and uh, there was a kind of a pent-up demand uh, in the economy that was ready to, to, to be... So it's, it's, uh, it's kind of difficult, but um, I mean, uh, it's not... Uh, I think what we, we have to clarify a little bit is that this reaction uh, was due to these uh, effect, extraordinary effects that these shocks had uh, on the economy in a very special situation. Thank you. Um, no, um, it's been a fascinating debate and to, to mention something that Manuela said in the session this morning, I mean, I, I think European Central Bank have uh, failed uh, very badly in being boring because, you know, we managed to discuss for two and a half hours, we still, you know, dig and argue and dispute. So that, that, that hasn't worked. One aspect which maybe hasn't, um, hasn't come up much, I'm curious why, so maybe somebody can, can, can answer, is, is wages, which is the, the, the topic I mentioned at the beginning, which is what I, I understand a little bit. Uh, because, and, and for me, that is significant because the, one of the main, maybe the main mechanism through which monetarism is expected to you know, be able to control inflation is uh, uh, the, the, the wage pr uh, price spiral. Uh, uh, and in the past, you know, that, that, that aspect of policy was very, very visible. The main ancestor of the European Central Bank, the, the German Bundesbank, was you know, a very precise policeman in terms of whenever labor was getting a little bit too much, it would, you know, uh, um, intervene in a restrictive way in order to protect and stabilize uh, export competitiveness. And now, despite the apparently tight labor markets, uh, you know, this, this doesn't seem to be a particularly important concern. So that it hasn't come up on a, as a main topic either in the analysis or in the theoretical discussion. Uh, in Italy, that is particularly the case because uh, a wage indexation, uh, which was uh, you know, abandoned uh, 31 years ago, has not been replaced by any institution. Uh, effect, which can effectively play uh, a role in that in that uh, potential wage uh, pri uh, price uh, spiral, despite the, the the effort by exactly Carlo Azeglio Ciampa in 1993. But that, you know that institution hasn't hasn't worked certainly in the way that, that Ciampa had uh, had planned. But even in the other countries, despite maybe a little bit more mobility, uh, that, that that hasn't been uh, been a case. I wonder whether anybody can explain that to me a little bit better. Uh, but obviously that is a topic that is covered in one chapter in Marius, uh, in Marius' book specifically. So maybe, maybe somebody wants to... Well, we are something. more an expert than we are on this, but uh, clearly the uh, un unspoken expectation of everyone... Can you switch off the microphone, perhaps? 
Um, the unspoken expectation is that the wages will be uh, still. So the unspoken expectation of, of, uh, um, of the, uh, the impact of all these things is that uh, there will be a balance of power between capital and labor such that uh, labor will be unable to do anything to recover the 15 percentage point of real wages, of real incomes, which has been lost in the case of Italy for the majority of uh, employees and pensioners. And this is, of course, an, an assumption which can be uh, easy to make for technocrats in, or in models but that in, in a real society can be uh, devastating some in some cases, and you can see them in the Gilets jaunes in France or in, uh, in uh, the abstention in uh, the political election or in the shift to the right uh, in the German uh, regional election of last month. So we have, a, a, in a way, the, the uh, social cost of an inflation which is uh, uh, punishing the poorer part of the population and uh, labor in particular is uh, sound, a contradiction which is bound to emerge sooner or later in some form or another and uh, we ignore this at our risk, at our peril. Uh, because clearly the impoverishment of the <clears throat> middle and lower classes uh, in Western Europe is the result of a long process of globalization, structural change, technological change, uh, and lack of an, an alternative trajectory of sustainable growth uh, uh, capable to provide uh, good jobs, skilled position, learning, higher wages, uh, a return of welfare uh, uh, services, and so on. In the long term, we, this is clearly leading to a major political and social contradiction, which uh, is going to be much more uh, uh, challenging than uh, the question of reputation of the technocrats. Yeah. Very good, very good. Looking forward to a question from our PhD students. We are our Thank you all. Uh, I had a comment related to the, this last topics of the conversation, so it relates to all the papers, but since we have uh, someone from the inside, maybe I'm more interested to have a response to Martina Ciccioni. And it's about the, the, the causes of inflation. No? And, and I was thinking when Francesco Saraceno mentioned the monetarist definition of inflation, that is problematic to say the least, but one of the problems is that also nobody really believes it, I guess. And nobody, and I think we can all agree that inflation was not caused by quantitative easing and it's a mix of supply side bottlenecks and the distributional nature, nature behind it. And my point is, I think that is the, the point. Like w the, there's a literature coming out uh, uh, about the seller's origin of inflation. So inflation due to uh, price makers and profit uh, driven uh, uh, price strategies. Um, and instead like I, I couldn't remember the exact phrasing but like I can remember the Bank of England governor uh, last year saying that uh, monetary tightening was needed because uh, it was a way to discipline uh, wage demands. And as Guglielmo said, there's no wage price spiral. And of course, maybe in the US, but ne definitely not in Italy and not in Europe. And also when you show the data about the origins of inflation, um, there was a lot of space due to energy price increase and food increases and just like a small amount of increase due to internal demand. So at this point, uh, the question will be if the distributional nature and the supply side uh, origin of, the, of the, this round of inflation is so evident that even central bankers and mainstream economists acknowledge it, why the standard response is to, to high interest rates even in the absence of a wage, uh, wage price, either in most of Europe, for example, and in Italy, for sure. Yes, I'll try to <laughs> answer. Uh, thanks for the question. It's very interesting. Uh, first of all, we didn't observe an increase uh, at the peak of inflation. We didn't observe an increase uh, in uh, nominal wages. As a matter of fact, the real wages, uh, both in Italy and the euro area, declined uh, during that period. Now we are seeing a little bit of a catch up. Uh, at the euro area level, we are around 5% of the increase, and this uh, increase is projected, these uh, uh, increases of nominal wages is projected to, to, to continue, uh, albeit uh, at a slower pace uh, uh, until 2025. So wages was not a cause uh, of inflation in this case. 
Now, why uh, this is, uh, it has to do with uh, the, the structure and the, 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 the kind of labor market that we have that might be different, like for example, for what we have in mind in the 70s. Uh, another reason can be the swift response of monetary policy. I do not have analysis that prove this, but this would be a, a nice, uh, question to be asked, uh, it's whether this swift response of monetary policy de facto uh, limited the, the wage increases to a uh, catch up of uh, uh, the kind that we are observing now and not a wage price spiral uh, in this sense. I don't know if I answered uh, <laughs> everything on your question and uh, maybe you have something to add. Uh, I would like to follow up and ask a question myself which is uh, linked to that, I think. So it was already pointed out that in your graph you pointed to inflation expectations becoming stabilized. Now, now the, my first question is, whose inflation expectations did you actually stabilize? Second question is, um, given that there are papers out there written by applied economists in central banks, such as uh, one at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York that really think that inflation expectations have no impact whatsoever on future inflation. How confident are you that stabilizing, again, whose inflation expectation? When you say uh, we stabilized inflation expectations, do you speak about financial market actors? Do you speak about households? Whom do you speak about? Okay, that's an interesting question because we were asking the same question ourselves at the beginning of the inflationary spirals, uh, the inflationary spike uh, episodes. So uh, traditionally, we have been monitoring uh, financial market expectation uh, simply because we have more data on this and uh, professional uh, forecaster expectation. So people that do this as a job <laughs> to forecast inflation. Now, the Bank of Italy has also um, uh, a survey uh, to firms in which we asked uh, what are their expectations on inflation. And uh, the survey, the data are public uh, and they're quite interesting. So we are monitoring also these. And uh, lately, uh, the, the, both the Bank of Italy and the ECB had a household survey on inflation expectation. So uh, while at the beginning it was more uh, financial markets and the professional forecast, uh, now there is uh, quite some attention also to households uh, and firms. Uh, and uh, exactly households and firms are those that were signaling some kind of uh, um, uh, inflation going up and becoming entrenched in their mindset and in, in their expectation. So, uh, of course, data on households are a little bit less reliable. They are new. They are, we do not have a, it's, uh, we do not have all countries. We do not have the whole uh, history of that. So it's kind of more difficult uh, to 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 be monitored. I don't know if this answers your question. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> I, I think the way that I uh, sometimes find myself defending technocrats when I was discussing this was. Uh, critical economists that were saying, you know, what are they doing, why are they doing, why do they raise interest rates and so on. I think um, and this is something that came up maybe also earlier. If there are no currently no other tools, you have only one tool, or if you have the feeling you only have one tool, and you need to signal that you're doing something about it, well, you're going to use that tool. So for me, it was, it was this, this, it could even be like, yeah, we know that it's the wrong tool, we think it doesn't do anything good, but we think that if we don't use it, it's even worse. You know, like we have to do some, we have to signal somehow that we do take inflation seriously and that we want to do something about it. And because we only have this one tool, we'll use it. And maybe that, that's also a way of reading what's going on that makes central bankers a little less foolish or paradigm driven or, you know, it's more like something needs to be done. I have, I, that's the way I read it, that the elite, this, the, the money elite said something has to be done because otherwise this gets out of control. We only have a hammer, let's hammer.
since we are now chatting, literally. Ah, sorry, sorry, Francesco, I interrupted you. <laughs> actually, it's, it's also a question for you, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think we have emphasized a lot some of the common themes that have come up. So let me uh, conclude probably highlighting probably some of the differences, or at least things that I'm not entirely convinced of. Uh, one thing that I'm not entirely convinced of is the 4% target that Mario was mentioning. Uh, and the question here for Mario is, uh, I see the point, but raising the, four, uh, the, the, the inflation target from two to four, in a moment in which central banks have been failing for over two decades, first because they were undershooting the target, right? <laughs> and now they cannot bring back the target. So it really raises an accountability problem. So why should you know, policymakers and the public accept that central banks that have been failing adjust their own benchmark, right? Is, is the, it's the same as if our students, you, know, you ask them to bring in their term paper in a month, and they say, you know what? I will bring it back in four months. It's fine. They do it all the time. They do it all the time, but it's a problem of accountability. You erode trust. So how, I mean, how can they do that? How can they raise from two to four without eroding, you know, also uh, accountability? The second thing that I don't know if we are exactly on the same page here is this multi-pronged approach, okay? I completely buy it and I was also the one that said at the end of the day, I mean, one of the major findings of my book is that we need coordination. Uh, but for me, coordination still means that the central banks have to do something. It's not that it's just fiscal policy. So here I, I understand the Bank of Italy issue, you know, when the, the inflation took double digit number, you cannot expect the central bank to stand still, you know, because we go back to the, to, to the inflation expectations that Otto Matthias raised, and I agree that, you know, it's uh, that they have the measurement problem, you know, that probably economists tend to exaggerate these inflation expectations, but still, we cannot completely ignore that they are there. You know, I, at least me, as an economic agent, I think about inflation and I try to anticipate if I have to, to do a mortgage or not, right? At least for this. So I think that in this multi pronged approach, at least my take is that everybody has to do something, including the central bank. We cannot expect the central bank to stay still and not to raise rates. And here I have a question for Matthias, because what do you think in terms of macroprudential policy, is the debate now among central bankers in a period of inflation? Because that is not clear to me. In this multi pronged approach, where do they stand? Because also, you know, I mean, financial stability is very important when interest rates rise. And so, how does it fit with this multi pronged approach? Okay. Uh on the inflation target, I will let Mario give your uh, opinion. I think we should completely separate two different levels here. The first is whether in today's world 2% is the correct inflation target. Higher for a number of reasons uh, that we could, uh, could discuss. And if yes, then it should be changed. The second level is when it should be changed, because I, on that I agree with you. Uh, changing the target while you're in the middle of a disinflation process is typically a typical uh, shift in the goalpost. Decades of failing it, but two I repeat, decades, but not one I, day. But I repeat, this should not be a reason for not discussing oh, sure. changing the target. It is just when changing the target. So this is just a of things about that, but I mean, that would be my take on your first part. The second, I mean, actually, I can, actually, actually I can answer to both of you together. Um, uh, but first on inflation expectations, uh, timing in my opinion matters. And if you look at the inflation expectation, the two and five year inflation expectations, they start decreasing in the fall of 2021. So well before central banks turn hawkish. And so my take is that markets were actually more rational, for once <laughs> rational, and so they understood better than many policymakers the uh, nature of inflation, right? And so, so the change in expectations, I'm not sure the change in expectation is the making of the restrictive uh, turn of central banks. I might be wrong, but I mean, of course, I'm not in the head of those who form these expectations. But I mean, if you look at the timing, it does not fit. If you, if you saw inflation expectations being 
high, not very high, not increasing, but high until 20, uh, spring 2022, and then they start decreasing, you could say is the restrictive turn that changed them. Actually, they start decreasing before, so probably markets started pricing in their expectations the uh, fading out of the temporary factors. So uh, but this is just for, uh, for uh, a comment. And on the multidimensional approach, I'm, and, and on the fact that we need to do something, well, I have a, uh, an answer which is maybe for both of you, and of course I don't, I don't, uh, not sure I will convince you. We should do something, but we should also be clear that we are not doing something wrong. <laughs> and the, the lamppost I was mentioning before. Second, there is something and something. So there was an alternative. It's not true that there was no alternative. There is no alternative only if you really buy the idea that, that inflation is there because of money. But if you don't buy this idea, which central banks themselves didn't buy initially, and they still don't. Sorry, I take you as central bank. I know you're not central bank. You're a person. Uh, uh, then, then you, the central banks could have said, listen, this inflation is going up. There is maybe no reason to keep the interest rate at zero or negative. There is no reason to have such a, a large balance sheet. So we'll start the normalization of monetary policy. We don't claim that to be something that we do for, to fight inflation, but maybe to actually uh, uh, coordinate with fiscal policies that should go and address the root problems. That would have been something. Uh, for the, dif the different episodes, right? The tightening in the different episodes. Nothing would have prevented the central bank, the ECB, to choose a path of the increase of interest rate less steep. So there, the signal was not we, we need to do something. The signal is we we are curbing inflation. So it's a wrong signal they're sending to markets. Okay, do do something, but do something with the tools that you should use, and maybe monetary. So maybe you should have that monetary policy helps the other tools and not vice versa. The idea behind this monetary tightening, such, uh, such a, uh, a strong monetary tightening, in my opinion, was we are in charge and the others need to help. Maybe it should have been, others should be in charge and we are here to help. So soon. Yeah, um, I got the question, right? I, I was taking you notes. Can react I, to was, whatever you want, Matthias. I was taking notes. Uh, yes, so I, I just think that um, it's an important point. Earlier, we heard about Minsky being discovered too late. I think what, what I'm what I'm studying right now is exactly um, central bankers do know that when they raise interest rates, banks um, well they benefit because they make more interest margins. But if they have a lot of uh, very low interest rate assets on their balance sheets, they go uh, accounting bankrupt. They don't go bankrupt, but they go accounting bankrupt. I mean, they, if they had to mark everything according to the market, they would be bankrupt. And they know that, and they don't take it into account. That, that's the fascinating thing. That's the new work that I'm trying to do, which is how come qualitatively central bankers know that, but when you look into their models, they really have a hard time integrating the negative effects of raising interest rates on financial system into the way that they raise interest rates. There is, There are some models out there that try to do that. They're called Financial Stability R+, for example, which is uh, a concept by Federal Reserve economists. But to me, all it says basically is financial instability and general equilibrium models very well together and so there is a shortcoming in terms of the analytical framework I think that is still prevalent and we discussed it this early afternoon why are DSGE models still running the show in central banks that's that's a there's a degree of a or or stickiness of models and theories that I cannot link to performance as such maybe coordination in central bank helps to coordinate around a model or something. ESGE models have shown so many weaknesses and they're still there and they're still, well, how important they are can be discussed, but they're very important still. I have a hard time understanding why that is.
about the inflation target. There, I, I mean, we, we talked about should it be raised from two to four percent and under what conditions, but there was also a, a preceding discussion about the cumulative level of inflation. So it, for all these years when the 2% target was missed downwards, um, you know, should central banks average over time and allow more inflation in order to catch up with past deflationary trends? And that, we don't hear anything about that. I wonder uh, why and also whether that would be uh, an approach that uh, guys might uh, might support um, uh, for now, or do you think it it's still the wrong way to think about the whole thing? Inflation targeting is don't have really a meaningful economy-wide uh, inflation rate, but an assembly of different rates. It have an inflation target at all? Very, very quickly on uh, on this inflation. In the in the book, we have a, a chapter with the model, which is not a DSG model, is a post keynesian model, where we t we simulate. Uh, the, uh, Marco is one of the author. We simulate different scenarios. Okay, the uh, the explanation of car of existing trend can be explained by only by both the energy shock and the profit shock. Okay, if there is. Uh, the tightening, monetary tightening within two years, uh, as uh, the Bank of Italy shows uh, with uh, her own DSG model, uh, inflation is absorbed and goes back to 2%. Uh, if, but the interesting thing is what happens if we have a full indexation of wages and therefore not uh, the, the, the punishing of labor. In this case, we have uh, a, a return over four years to the 2% level, but we have a much higher GDP growth pattern because the demand is there. And therefore, you accommodate a softer la landing over a longer period with, without punishing uh, three quarters of the population uh, and uh, without uh, uh, letting finance uh, uh, off the hook. So it's, it's an interesting question about uh, who gains and who loses from the different policy alternatives, and we need a debate uh, explicit about that. So the 4% idea, which comes from Blanchard and Stiglitz, which were rooted in, in your argument and in the missing the 2% target from below, uh, uh, comes from an understanding that we have to have a multi-objective perspective and GDP growth accommodates a lot of stability challenge, avoids, for instance, uh, inequality, but avoids also the risk of uh, debt crisis of uh, private companies or of banks. And uh, uh, a little bit of inflation uh, reduces the uh, real value of, of debt and therefore is, is, uh, helps uh, uh, continue with, uh, with uh, economic activities even in adverse economic conditions and uh, reduces the risk of a financial bubble burst. So it, all these uh, are positive elements of inflation provided that uh, real wages and real incomes are protected. So that's why. So let's just finish with the fantasy. Imagine an extraordinary meeting of the European Council inviting in Brussels the European Central Bank and uh, the European Commission and uh, the European trade unions and the green uh, organizations saying, okay, we are in an extraordinary situation. We have to coordinate our policies. And in this context, we would uh, prioritize, for instance, the avoidance of a recession in Europe. So the, the graph that I would keep an eye on is the graph on credit and investment. In, we have to make sure that this, there is no collapse of uh, investment and demand, and that we adjust uh, interest rates as a function of our goal of keeping uh, GDP growth uh, uh, positive, 2% two, two perhaps, uh, and which would be an unprecedented goal given the record of European Union indeed. And we understand that all the new demand and the new investment has to go to the Green New Deal, to the ecological transition, and to the, the reduction of inequality. 
And uh, for doing this, we have to adjust perhaps some tax policies, but that would be another workshop, and uh, uh, coordinate support of demand in order to reach this uh, GDP growth, and monetary policy, which can be clearly more, tight, more tighter than in QE times, but at the same time not punishing the economy as a whole. But this, of course, is a fantasy in Europe. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mario. And, uh, oh, yes, uh, please. I would have a question I want to follow up uh, on, on this. Uh, it's a question that came to me when I was watching your presentation, which is the following. At the beginning of the presentation, you said the, our inflation expectations were wrong, were off. The central bank was off. No, not a problem. They, they, I'm not, they, I'm Just not to clarify, uh, this is, uh, these are uh, projections. Yes, exactly. So, so the, the inflation projections were wrong. Then you show us uh, what happened, and then you end with a graph that says, and therefore, this is our inflation projection for the next two years. <laughs> and I just wanted to point to that. Yeah, but uh, you missed one slide. <laughs> oh, in which, in which in you which found we the right model. Right. In which you found the right model. No, of in which we, because we ask this question, of course, what, what's wrong in these models? I mean, this is a fair question, and uh, we, we devoted a lot of time, as you can imagine, to understand what was, we were missing. And one of the things we were missing, for example, was gas prices. We didn't have gas prices in our projection. And, but from this exercise that we have in the annual report that concern uh, Italian projection, uh, so projection for Italian inflation, there we see that uh, much of the error that we made uh, was due to this unprecedented shock uh, uh, on energy and gas prices. So now this uh, not, does not put a full point on the question because maybe we do not understand the oil market or we do not understand completely the gas market. Uh, so this is something that, uh, that, that we have to study on. But uh, uh, it was quite comforting that uh, it was not too much uh, how the model uh, w was working that uh, was leading to these high projection errors, but uh, the, 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 the unprecedented uh, increases in, in these commodity prices. Um, but if I may add a question, a short question, which is, uh, is there a probability for a financial crisis in your prediction? We do have credit. Uh, we do have uh, credit, but uh, we do not have a probability of a financial crisis. Yeah. No. I mean, it's quite, if someone has a model on this, <laughs> please share it. <laughs> We're going to make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. So a lot of uh, market advice in addition to a lot of insights uh, today. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, all the panelists, both for the presentation and the generosity and uh, you know livelihood of of the discussion. It's been uh, has been great. A great three hours. So let me just uh, say that uh, you know the Insti Champion Institute keeps its uh, activity. The next one is uh, uh, on Tuesday. Next week, it's a uh, Carla Zendio Ciampi lecture by uh, David Soskis on the second digital revolution and the contested transformation of, of advanced democratic capitalism. That is, uh, yeah, 31st of October, Halloween. There's nothing better to do than discussing this topic. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>